first up, we're going to be covering the GCW Ultraviolet Championship, which Rita Yamashita hasn't defended since October of last year. Her challenger on the March 4th GCW Holy Smokes event would be none other than Casey Kirk, who has absolutely skyrocketed in popularity over the past year. After getting through what looked like a little bit of nerves from Kirk, her and Rena absolutely killed it. At some points during this match, Rena looked like a deranged serial killer. With as crazy as this match got, somehow this curb stomp right here onto the steel chair looked like one of the most devastating things of the entire night. Eventually, Casey did get some big offense in with the spear into a pane of glass set up in the corner. She would then grab a gusset plate and drive it right into Rena's skull. And then we got one of the biggest spots of the night. Rena would blast Casey with some light tubes just before bringing her off the top rope through a barbed wire door on the outside of the ring. And if that wasn't enough, they would go right back into trading light tube shots. And that really set up a pretty cool moment this month. After the tube shots to the head, Rena grabbed a chair to hit Casey in the head with it, but she wisely covered up with her hands, letting them take the blow instead. Rena then invited Casey to give her a shot to the head, which she did not block with her hands. Rena went for round two and Casey once again pulled her hands up. And that is when Casey freaked out, screaming for more, throwing her arms behind her back and took a monster unprotected shot to the head only to kick out at one and the crowd lost their minds yes we all know headshots are bad but this little exchange got me and the rest of the crowd fired up even more cementing casey as an absolute badass to everyone and somehow the match only got better from here there were even more light tube headshots there was a beautiful looking power bomb and that was followed up by a beautiful looking pile driver we got a straight jacket suplex. Rena hit a frog splash onto some tubes. And then to close it all out, we finally got that sit out razor's edge to get the three count. If you are only going to watch one death match this month, make sure this is the one. Making her sixth defense of the GCW Ultra Violent Championship, Rena Yamashita took on Jimmy Lloyd in the main event of the May 20th show titled The Way I Am. Some early gusset plates got Jimmy Lloyd leaking from his forehead, while Rena used half of the light tubes on herself. There was a point where Rena was able to muscle Jimmy up onto her shoulders to then roll off the ring apron, driving him straight through a door on the floor. Jimmy was able to recover and land a huge assault driver onto Rena through a pane of glass. That would not be enough to keep the champ down because she would kick out at one. Rena would then roll through a pane of glass with Jimmy on her shoulders yet again, just before climbing up to the top rope, hitting a beautiful looking frog splash. That's where Jimmy would quickly roll Rena up, trying to steal the match and the title, but she was able to kick out just before the three. That would also prove to be Jimmy's last hope because a splash mountain threw a barbed wire door later, and that was all she wrote. Rena Yamashita scored the victory and walked out still the GCW ultraviolet champ. Just six days later in the main event at GCW's lifestyle show, Rena would put the ultraviolet title yet again on the line, but this time against Cole Radderick. This was actually a rematch from back in October of 2022, where Rena defeated Cole in Japan at the War Ready event. That match was very good and no surprise here, this also delivered. Per usual, Rena was out here breaking just as many light tubes on herself as she did her opponent. Ratty Daddy must have watched Rena's match last week against Jimmy Lloyd because he wouldn't make the same mistake Lloyd did on the outside. He's the one who would hit the DVD on Rena off the ring apron through the door. This match was very back and forth, seeing several different moves that could have ended the match like Cole's air raid crash through a pane of glass, or even Rena's air raid crash onto a chair and light tube. Later, Cole would hit a nice middle rope senton, but Rena and answered with multiple headbutt light tube shots. The end finally did come though after Rena power bombed Raderick through a thick pane of glass and then followed that up with her splash mountain bomb to get the win. That means next month in June, Rena Yamashita will enter Tournament of Survival 8, your current GCW ultra violent champion. And at this point, I think she has to be one of the favorites to win the entire thing. Night one of GCW's homecoming weekend saw the ultra violent champion Rina Yamashita defend her title against fellow 
pro wrestling freedom star, Takashi Sasaki. I thought Sasaki was about to pull out a freaking sword in the middle of this death match, but it was something even cooler, a light tube sword, which he used to bash Rena over the head with. There were several barbed wire door spots in this match. The first one was when Rena drove her challenger through the door in the corner. She was later body slammed and then suplexed onto another one. She ate one more suplex onto the barbed wire, this time from the top rope. And after all that, all it did was just fire the champ up. And speaking of getting fired up, it wouldn't be a Rena match without her smashing some light tubes over her own head. Sasaki landed a lot of hard hitting blows here with these light tube kicks in the corner, this head shot right here, a knee into the face, and a decapitating light tube bundle. With all that said, Rena just refused to stay down. She drove him down onto a barbed wire chair. She twisted the man's junk and capped it all off with her trademark splash mountain bomb onto light tubes and barbed wire to get that win. Rena goes on to retain on night number one. In the main event, the very next night, Night on August 20th, Rena put her ultra violent title on the line yet again, but this time her freedom's opponent would be Vilento Jack. Rena marched down to the ring with light tubes and started the match off right away. This match would top out at 20 minutes, seeing Jack show his brute strength to overpower the champion. As many light tube shots as he took, he kept pushing and moving forward like the Terminator, oftentimes getting the better of Rena. The rolling fireman's carry on the outside looks like it could have done Rena in, but it took Jack just a little too long to recover himself. As much as Jack pleaded with Rena just to stay down, the underdog champ continued to fight back. After Rena's big splash from the top, Jack rolled her right through and brought her down with a brain buster. Just to show him up though, Jack would hit a swanton off the top where she pulled him right up and then slammed him down with a German suplex. 15 minutes deep into this match and they start trading light tube headshots. Absolutely crazy. Just when it looked like Rena got the better of the exchange, Jack just launched a full stack into her face. To counter Jack on the top rope, Rena surprised him with either a kiss or bited him on the nose. I'm not sure which one, but either way, it was effective. She smashed some light tubes over his backside and then brought him down through a pane of glass and light tubes with her splash mountain bomb. Somehow though, Jack countered her pin with his own submission. Just when it was looking like we were about to get a new champion, Arena rolls him over, pinning his shoulders to the mat and gets that win. Rena Yamashita leaves homecoming weekend still the GCW ultra violent champion. She actually won this title back at homecoming weekend last year. So that marks one full year as the champ. September was quite the month for the GCW Ultra Violent Championship. Rina Yamashita brought the title to the UK to defend it against Scotland's Emerson Jane on September 15th. After two quick German suplexes to start this match off, light tubes just started flying. Emerson would counter Rina, slamming her face first into a cluster of light tubes in the corner, opening up a bad cut on Rina's cheek. Blood was literally pouring from both competitors at this point. Just when you thought Rina seen the worst of it, Emerson grabbed a hacksaw, yes, I just said a hacksaw, and began sawing away at the champion head. I wasn't kidding. Look at the blood just pouring down Rena's face here. If you can tell already, the Madonna of the death match, Emerson Jane, looked great in this match. If it wasn't her lethal snap suplexes, it was her Frankensteiner on the tubes. If it wasn't her suicide dives, it was her brutal kicks. Right when I thought Rena was about to lose her title, she reached down deep, driving the challenger down to the mat with her trademark Splash Mountain Bomb to score the win. And you know what? Full disclosure here, I've never heard of Emerson Jane before this match. And if you're in the same boat as I was in, you need to go out of your way to seek her out. Great performance from both competitors here, but Rena limps away, still the champ. Believe it or not, the very next night at GCW in Liverpool, Rena Yamashita put her title on the line yet again. This time against Session Moth Martina, who did not seem to be super excited to step into a death match with Rena. In fact, if Session wasn't trying to run away from the match, she was trying to bribe the champion. And no surprise here, but none of that worked out. It was only a matter of time before Session's blood started to flow. The champ was in total control of this match until she slipped up and poured beer down Session's throat, completely energizing her and practically got her hulking up to beat away at her opponent. After several counters trying to take advantage here, Rena was the one who drove Session through a carpet strip board with an air raid crash. It was a fun game of cat and mouse for a while, but in the end, Rena hit that deadly splash mountain bomb through a bunch of light tubes to snag that three count win. That makes 
for two impressive defenses, meaning Rene Mashta leaves Liverpool still the GCW ultra violent champion. Then the following weekend, GCW traveled to Germany to work some shows with WXW. And on September 22nd at the show titled Long Live GCW, Rena defended her ultra violent championship against Jimmy Lloyd. Actually, this marks the different boys second shot at Rena. He suffered a loss to her back in May in Detroit. A kendo stick was introduced into this match, which absolutely shattered over the head of the champion. Jimmy tried using barbed wire and staple guns against Rena, doing anything to just slow her down. But I think we all know that's just about impossible at this point because she grabbed some skewers, driving them into his forehead and gave him a scary looking DDT. Just to show you how insane she actually is, she pulled the skewers out of Jimmy's head and drove him into her own to fire herself up. And what would have put an end to any other champion's reign, Jimmy Lloyd drove Rena down through two barbed wire boards onto a concrete floor. But Rena is just a different human being. She would battle back to hit her big splash onto another barbed wire board and then power Jimmy up into the air, bringing him down onto a chair to finish him off with that Splash Mountain Bomb. With that win, that makes Rena three for three in title defenses in September. And oh yeah, she wasn't done just yet. You guessed it, less than 24 hours later, Rena Yamashita would come down to the ring one more time at the GCW versus the World Show to defend her ultra-violent championship against Lou Nixon, who was making his GCW debut. Lou thought that he was going to outsmart his opponent by gluing thumbtacks to his fist to start the match, but Rena latched onto his arm and quickly cleared all the tacks off. The champion then really took advantage of the inner gender portion of this match with her testicular claw, make that a double claw, followed by a perfectly placed staple gunshot. As Rena does, she found a unique way to introduce thousands of thumbtacks into this match. That's where they traded German suplex after suplex after suplex after suplex. Storage bins even found their way into this match when Nixon launched Rena off the top rope, sending her crashing down through a pyramid of them. Knowing he had to push Rena to her absolute limit, Lou made his way up the stage to retrieve a weed whacker. Rena quickly disarmed her opponent and slammed the weed whacker into Nixon's arm, slicing his skin up. All that was left to do was set up a makeshift barbed wire board bridge and send Nixon through it with a splash mountain bomb. Oh yeah, Rena picks up the victory and makes it four successful title defenses for the GCW Ultra Violent Championship all in the month of September. GCW made their way back to Japan as the ultra violent champion Rita Yamashita, now deep into her 400 plus day reign as champion, put her belt on the line against Taka Yuki Yuki at GCW's To Live and Die in Tokyo event on October 10th. Now, this would be a wild match, which nearly hit that 20 minute mark, seeing all kinds of craziness. To start things off, both competitors went flying headfirst through a barbed wire board, with Rena probably getting the worst of it, to be honest. With the fight staying out amongst the fans, Ayuki grabbed a fan's umbrella and body slammed Rena onto it. If yes, me. It's kind of rude, but I do love it. So the challenger brought this cheese grater into play and, you know, nothing crazy there, right? Well, how about a cheese grater on a power drill? He was about to use it down low on Rena, but even she surprised herself with this counter. As Rena started to fight back, as she always does, she hit a body slam onto the challenger, onto this chair and barbed wire board. Gusset plates then came into play, first into Takayuki, and then Rena just drove them into her own head, firing herself up. That's around the time Takayuki Yuki started to strip down and gave Rena a low blow. But stripping down would cost him big because he would be driven down bare feet first onto barbed wire. In a weird twist, he would shoot the champ up onto his shoulders and spin around on the barbed wire, all being barefoot. What am I watching right now? Rena would try to counter with a pin, but no luck there. If things weren't crazy enough, Rena would then pull her shoes off as well, driving her opponent into the barbed wire. With that barbed wire still hanging off of both of them, she would hit that splash mountain bomb to secure the win. Like I said, a wild match, a fun match too, with Rena leaving still the champion. Two nights later, still in Japan, Rena Yamashita would place her GCW Ultraviolet Championship on the line, but this time inside the infamous Corkin Hall at GCW's The World on GCW event against Masha Slamovich. That is right, folks. We got a rematch from their awesome battle back at Cage of Survival 2, and this match here certainly did not disappoint. Just like Rena's first title defense of the month, 
This would also hit that nearly 20 minute mark. A light tube to the head sent Rita into her Matrix style move, but as she came out of it, she took another brutal shot. The champ would be in for a rough night because she would also take an air raid crash onto the outside through a bunch of tubes. Now back in the ring, Rena brought Masha down onto some tubes with a big suplex from the top rope. Going back and forth with a crown of barbed wire, Masha tore into Rena and kicked her head off right here with some light tubes to the head. The champion would be able to kick out of this scary looking hangman's powerbomb. And you know what? Just like their first encounter, the strikes in this match were absolutely vicious. They traded some light tube shots until they had to reload with a big light tube bundle where they collided with one another. The crowd was really loving this match. And then this pal driver right here is the closest Rena has came to losing her title. But after countering this kick to the head, Rena took full control. She drilled Masha with tubes to the head and then would land not one, but two Splash Mountain Bombs to get the victory. That means the reign continues as Rena Yamashita finishes October still your GCW Ultra Violent Champion. And at this point, I don't know if she's ever going to lose the title. On November 11th, Rina Yamashita put her GCW Ultra Violent Championship on the line in Japan at Pro Wrestling Freedom's Nagoya Bloodland 2023 event. The challenger would be Daisuke Masaoka. Man, I hope I'm close to even pronouncing some of this stuff right, but some nice technical wrestling started things off with Rina proving her strength early on. Even so, she would be the first to get a taste of the ultra violence. With the more quiet traditional Japanese crowd, you could really hear the hits these two were laying in. I'm not gonna lie, the welcoming of gusset plates to the forehead is always frightening to see. Now with a table set up on the outside, Rena would drive Daisuke down head first, seeing them both crash to the floor, and you know how hard those Japanese tables are to break. The intensity would pick up as Rena would be ran straight through a board with cut soda cans attached to it. She would get even though by torturing Daisuke with some barbed wire, but he was still able to showcase his agility, trying his best to capture the championship. He almost did just that, but he nearly crushed Rena with this ladder from the top rope. And then he would follow that up with two sit out pal drivers and even sat full weight on Rena's face. And that still wouldn't be enough. Even after this nice meteor here, the champ refused to stay down much to the challenger's shock. The result was looking pretty grim for Rena, but she dug down deep as she always does and would land this sky high counter superplex from the top of the ladder. She followed that up by stacking chairs and a barbed wire board in the middle of the ring where she would eventually hit that splash mountain bomb to pick up the hard, very hard fought victory. So in an almost 20 minute battle, Rina Yamashita successfully defends her title for a record 16th time and her reign is approaching 500 days. I want to give a quick shout out to a Olus and James L underscore TRW. That's top rope writing, by the way, for hooking me up with the footage here that you saw in this match recap. Thank you guys. It really does mean a lot. On December 10th, GCW traveled down to Mexico to do a joint show with Zona 23 in the junkyard. That is where GCW Ultra Violent Champion Rina Yamashita put her title on the line against another deathmatch veteran, Ludark Shatan. A little technical wrestling got things started off, but it wouldn't be long before a barbed wire chair was introduced. Now with this match being in a junkyard, you knew it would only be a matter of time before the fight spilled outside of the ring and over towards junk cars. Rena hit a nice looking suplex caving in the top of this car. Ludark tried her best to drive the champ through the windshield, but then missed this senton costing her big time. Back in the ring, Rena gave Ludark a free chair shot only for her to take it like the champ that she is. Rena would then flip her challenger up into the air and connect with her splash mountain bomb in the corner onto a car hood to put her down for the three count. Quick match here, but Rena puts a nice little bow on 2023, ending the year still your GCW Ultra Violent Champion, a belt that she has now held for over 500 days. At H2O's Hustle and Gold event, we have the H2O World Champion One Called Manders taking on the Danny Havoc Hardcore Champion, Brandon Kirk. Originally, this was supposed to be a non-title match, but Brandon threw down the challenge, put his title on the line as long as Manders would do the same. Manders did accept the title stipulations, but only if the match was held under Manders' rules. 
Manders rules really just meant this would be a straight up wrestling match where Manders would end up getting himself disqualified after a low blow. So yes, no, there was no ultra violence that took place here, but it was still a solid match and had some fun story building. And as you could guess, yes, both guys left with their title still in their possession. Brandon Kirk put his ICW American Deathmatch Championship on the line, as well as his H2O Danny Havoc Hardcore title against Clint Margera. And wouldn't you know it, we got another really good title match here. Like I said, the ICW title was on the line, but the Danny Havoc title really was the focus of this match, technically making it become a world title after this. There were a lot of light tube shots to the head here, as well as a handful of kisses. Things got a little wild, what can I tell you? After some quality hybrid wrestling here, Brandon Kirk planted Margera with his psycho driver, fuck you life, to score the win. Next up, we head over to the Hardcore Hustle organization, where Brandon Kirk was putting his H2O Danny Havoc Hardcore World Championship on the line against the first ever Danny Havoc Hardcore champ, Bam Sullivan. And this match started out how any good death match should with a double nut clutch. Now this wasn't your bloodiest death match of the month, but it saw plenty of unorthodox brawling outside of the ring. We got trading shotgun kicks through doors. Bam Sullivan had his face driven straight into a grocery cart, as well as his body nearly impaled onto a board with forks sticking out of it. But later Bam would take control of the match where he would pull out a television. So I guess a TV just isn't enough. Bam had to go pull out a bottle of lighter fluid and then completely soaked the screen with it. As soon as Bam lit the TV ablaze, Kirk scooped him up from behind, hitting a surprise psycho driver, fuck your life, onto the burning monitor. With his knee still on fire, Brandon dove on top of Bam, covering him to get the win. And with that win, Brandon Kirk continues his now eight month reign as Danny Havoc, hardcore world champion. First things first, the H2O Danny Havoc Hardcore World title was on the line on June 11th in what was originally a rematch between champion Brandon Kirk and Bam Sullivan. But just before the show, Marcus Mathers was introduced, making this a triple threat match. Then somehow after the bell sounded, Jimmy Lloyd's music hit and he came out forcing this to be a four way. High Flying quickly broke out on the outside of the ring, but Bam was the one to strike first blood on Jimmy Lloyd with a fork to the forehead. He would then plant Kirk down onto some barbed wire. After several more near falls, we found all competitors down and out. The pace of this match would ramp up to high speed as Marcus took a pile driver through a chair and Bam hit a DVD on Jimmy onto a board of forks. Kirk teased some lighter fluid by going to light up the backboard of a basketball hoop, but it was spoiled by Mathers. Then we got this awesome finishing sequence where Marcus hit a 450 on the Jimmy Lloyd, but Kirk scooped him right up and hit a Powell driver on him. Bam tried to come in and steal the win, but was pulled right back out of the ring and hit with a chair. Brandon rolled back into the ring, hitting his psycho driver, fuck your life, to pick up the win. After this really good match here, Brandon Kirk walks out of H2O's seventh anniversary show, still your Danny Havoc Hardcore World Champion. On July 29th at Barbed Wire City Showdown 2, we saw a Stairway to Havoc match between the challenger, Bam Sullivan, and the champion, Brandon Kirk. With the title hanging above the ring, both men started playing a little bit of mind games by setting the ladder up together and then climbing up together. Eventually, Kirk would trick Bam and the match got going from there. As you would expect, there were a bunch of ladders used in this match with nobody really getting full control of the match. Then at one point, Bam would set up a smaller ladder with a bunch of light tubes on the top of it, while Brandon set up a door and panes of glass bridges on the opposite side. Brandon grabbed Bam, looking for a power bomb off the ladder, but instead he caught a chair to the face. Both men would then once again climb to the top of the ladder where they would trade light tube headshots back and forth. Bam won that trade off with one final blow to the skull and with Kirk hanging on the side of the ladder, Bam started to squirt lighter fluid onto the pane of glass down beside them. The challenger would then chuck the champ off the ladder, so he fell through the flaming glass contraption, but unfortunately for Brandon, it did not break, and he rolled out of the ring on fire. That is when Bam was free to pull down the title, becoming the first two-time Danny Havoc Hardcore World Champion. Kirk's title reign comes to an end after a whopping 320 days, meaning that he held this title longer than anybody else in the company's history. I also want to point out that Mouse came out right after the match, and it looks like Bam already has his first challenger lined up. 
The new H2O Danny Havoc Hardcore World Champion Bam Sullivan was set to defend his title for the first time against Mouse at H2O's No Rain event. There were a ton of counters early as Mouse tried to get into the head of the champion. Bam was the first to introduce light tubes into the match with a home run shot to the back. Going for a suicide dive with another tube to the outside cost him big though when Mouse caught him with a chair. Mouse would get some solid offense in though on Bam with this Frankensteiner here sending the champ crashing through a door. He destroyed a keyboard over Sullivan's back before planting him with a front face DDT down onto it. The champ brought the heat himself though with this X suplex through a chair. He also drove Mouse through a door with this nice spear. And we cannot forget this beautiful looking code breaker with a light tube. The end was just around the corner though because Mouse took just a little too long setting up some light tubes onto a chair allowing Bam to strike. He scooped Mouse up and slammed him through the tubes with a Death Valley bomb and all that was left to do was roll Mouse over, pinning him to pick up the victory. So there is your headline, folks. Bam Sullivan retains the Danny Havoc Hardcore title at H2O No Rain. Things were personal in the H2O Danny Havoc Hardcore Championship match that took place at Hustle Mania 6. Champion Bam Sullivan would be putting the belt on the line against Jimmy Chondo Lion, who believes no one has put their body on the line more than he has inside of H2O. Both men tasted carpet strips early in the match, but without a doubt, Chondo got the worst of them. Luckily for Chondo though, low blows were completely legal. After a double stomp from the middle rope here, Chondo appeared to have suffered a bad cut and had to get it taped up immediately. And I mean, leave it to Jimmy, the one time he gets cut bad was the time he's wearing boots. With the champ on the ropes here, Chondo set up a dangerous looking chair upside down with light tubes laying across it. He was going for his crossroads here, but was countered with Bam's rolling Death Valley driver nearly impaling the challenger. That would be that. Bam Sullivan picked up the win and retains the H2O Danny Havoc Hardcore World Championship. On October 28th at H2O Bound by Blood, the Danny Havoc Hardcore World Championship kicked off with Bam Sullivan storming the ring attacking the challenger, President Hawkins. This match saw a ton of interference and resembled more of a tag team match at points with Brax and JB Anderson at ringside. We did see some cookie sheets, a gusset plate, and some chairs, but other than that, this match mainly focused on the story of the president's shady cabinet trying to screw Bam over. It seemed like no matter what they tried to do to Bam, he refused to stay down. Now, the end of this match did seem a little wonky here as JB punched Hawkins, seeing him gracefully fall down into a door. At that exact same time, Brax brought Bam crashing down on top of him with an electric chair drop. Bam laid on top of the president to pick up the win, meaning that Bam holds on to the title through the month of October. On November 25th at H2O's last November event, Bam Sullivan would have his work cut out for him as he put his Danny Havoc Hardcore Championship up against the full-time boss, Christian Ross. And holy cow, right away, you could see the strength advantage that Bam had to try to overcome in this match. He would have to barrel full speed at Ross, hitting him with a shoulder block, sending him crashing through a barbed wire door. Seeing what was working, he would try to hit Ross again full speed with a suicide dive to the outside, but he was caught and slammed not just onto the ring apron, but spine first onto the edge of the ring apron. As if his back didn't take enough punishment there, the challenger would wail away at it with trash cans lids. Not to mention the suplex through chairs that he would take a little bit later. Though it would be Christian who would introduce a couple light tube bundles into this match that Bam thought he was going to block, but took a punch through a lid instead. And then just straight up ate a bundle right after that. As Ross was about to chokeslam Bam through the other barbed wire door, the champ would counter by driving a gusset plate into the top of his head. Ross would rip that out and then threw his body at Bam who dove out of the way and crashed through that door. With the match now spiraling out of control for Ross, Sullivan would would smash another bundle of tubes over his head and then lock him into a cross face using barbed wire grinded it into his forehead. Christian Ross was forced to tap out, meaning that Bam Sullivan leaves H2O's last November still your Danny Havoc Hardcore World Champion. Bam Sullivan came to the ring on December 23rd to defend his H2O Danny Havoc Hardcore Championship against a man who recently has made his way to H2O and that is the carnivore Remington Roar. Let me just say, if this was a triple threat involving Waffle House, Bam would have jobbed him out. 
So we got some stiff forearm shots starting this match off, and then Bam was quickly slammed through a door with a half Nelson suplex. The challenger would first show his viciousness by trying to choke Bam out with a chain, and then his strength by planting Bam down through a steel chair, almost impaling him in the process. Bam would get himself right back into this match, though, with a spine buster here, a couple shots with a short ladder, and then this frog splash through a door. Maybe not the smartest idea in the world here, but Remington Roar placed a chair over the head of Bam, and then would go on to deliver a flying headbutt with a chair in front of his own head. I mean, who knows? Double concussions never sounds like a good plan, but maybe that's just me. Roar would end up building this crazy contraption here with a couple ladders and some barbed wire lattice. Whatever his plan was going to be, it backfired because Bam would counter with a couple of running forearm shots and then brought Roar down onto this debris, rendering his challenger down long enough to score that three count victory. Bam Sullivan retains and will be heading into 2024, your H2O, Danny Havoc, hardcore world champion. John Wayne Murdoch came out first, putting his Horror Slam Deathmatch title on the line in the first round of the Friday the 13th tournament, a title that he has held for 499 days. His opponent would be the veteran DBA. Murdoch jumped DBA right off the start of this thing, not even letting him get into the ring. Then one bundle of tubes to the back of the head set DBA off. These two lit each other up with tons of tubes to the head. I haven't seen DBA this fired up in a long, long time. And as for the crowd, they were absolutely loving this. As the pace of the match slowed down a bit, they battled around the ringside area using more glass, some chains, scissors even, and of course, a staple gun to the groin. And then DBA was nearly broken in half with a suplex onto a chair, but he refused to stay down. He would slam Murdoch down onto that chair with a DVD and then finish him off with a flaming elbow drop. Big upset here in the first round, but DBA advances and he becomes the Horror Slam Deathmatch Champion for the first time in his career. So to the five-way elimination finals we go, the winner would not only win the Friday the 13th tournament, they would also leave with the Horror Slam Deathmatch title that DBA would be defending here. He would be defending against Satu Jin, the Carnivore, Remington Roar, Malcolm Monroe III, who would be looking to become a double champion, and also John Wayne Murdoch, who just lost the title in the first round and took J.J. Escobar's spot in this match. Very quickly, this would break down into full chaos with fights breaking out all over the place, making it hard to keep up with the action. Look at this, there was just glass flying all over the place. Murdoch and DBA picked up right where they left off in the first round, trading light tube headshots. There would be some two-on-one taking place with DBA and his son Malcolm teaming up against Murdoch. They would also set their sights on Roar at one point. But with the tournament and title on the line, that alliance would not last forever. Speaking of alliances, just when it looked like Murdoch was going to team up with his friend Satu Jin, he used a taser on his back, rolling him up to eliminate him from this match. Just 10 seconds later, Murdoch rolled DBA up, eliminating him from this match as well. With DBA out and now down to just three, we are guaranteed a new champion. Malcolm would steal Murdoch's taser, using it on him before driving him down into his own knee to finish off the Duke of Hardcore. A loud roar chant came from the crowd as the two last remaining competitors squared off. A pane of glass was set up, but as Malcolm tried to use his chloroform on Roar, he was able to break away, drilling MM3 with a right, and then brought him down through the glass to score the win. Remington Roar wins the first tournament of 2023 and will also be taking home the Horror Slam Deathmatch title. Well, not really. Satu Jin would come out, cashing in his anytime title shot, beating Roar to claim the title, spoiling his night. The Horror Slam Deathmatch Championship was also on the line at this same Blood Kings event. And I want to say real quick, sorry about the footage here. There's no better quality on YouTube. So this is kind of what we're dealing with. This match came to be after Satu Jin cashed in his anytime title opportunity at the Friday the 13th show last month. He pretty much stole the title from Roar right after he won the tournament. So here we are. This is their one on one match. Little rematch time. As you can see, no time was wasted bringing light tubes into the mix here. Roar took full advantage early on in this match, too. Let me tell you, there were plenty of light tube headbutt shots to go around. After a clothesline backfired on Roar, he took a brutal looking DVD right before this bad boy came to a close. And the final blow didn't quite go as planned, I assume, but it still looked devastating nonetheless. As Satu caught Roar coming off the top rope, he backed up just enough to knock the Toshiba TV off the chairs it was sitting on. 
That didn't matter, though. Jin slammed Remington Roar down onto the TV regardless to pick up the three-count victory, and that marked Satu Jin's first successful Horde Slam deathmatch title defense. Heading over to Horror Slam now, we have a triple threat match for the Horror Slam Deathmatch Championship. This match took place at the death of the Easter Bunny Show. And first of all, I want to say thank you to Nicole Schlazinski. I think that's how you pronounce that. Not sure. Uh, either way, for this HD footage from this match. The Purge's Sean Tyler was the first man to the ring to take on the former Horror Slam Deathmatch champion DBA and the current champion, Satu Jin. Despite being double teamed right at the start of this match, Jin took control, slamming both of his opponents through a door and a barbed wire board. There were lots of light tubes used in this match here, including several different headshots, including this slam on the ring apron right here. And then at one point, Jin nearly unloads an entire box of light tubes onto the head and back of Sean Tyler. Later on, after burying his opponents in chairs, DBA went to do a dive on top of his opponents, but they both moved out of the way and it looked Looked like he almost broke his back in the process. Once back into the ring, we saw Jin hit a falcon arrow on Tyler, but the count was broken up by DBA, who hit a Russian leg sweep followed by this senton onto some tubes. But it wasn't enough to get the win though. The end did come when Satu Jin found himself on the ring apron where DBA threw Tyler into him, sending Jin falling out onto some light tube boards onto the floor. With Jin now out of the mix, DBA lit his elbow on fire, driving it down into the heart of Sean Tyler to pick up the victory. There you have it, DBA is your new Horror Slam Deathmatch Champion and will now begin his second reign. As for Satu Jin, his title run comes to an end at 84 days with sadly only one successful title defense. DBA was making his first Horror Slam Deathmatch title defense of this title reign against the man he took the title from, that is Satu Jin, and this took place on the May 19th Horror Slam versus GCW4 show. Early on, DBA had a hard time dealing with Jin's size and strength but there's nothing a water jug can't fix. They fought out into the fan seats where DBA would start rapid firing light tube shots over the head of Jin. After that though, Jin took full control of this match, putting a straight up beat down on the champ. During this time, Satu Jin brought out his trademark big blade and began cutting through the forehead and mouth of DBA. The tables turned, however, when DBA countered Jin by slamming him face first through a pane of glass set up in the corner of the ring. He would go on to connect with his flaming elbow drop but just before the three count, John Wayne Murdoch pulled the referee out of the ring just out of view of the camera. DBA took a scary looking shot right to the eye with a light tube here, and it was looking like we were gonna get a screw job from the rejects. But DBA was able to duck under a light tube shot here from Murdoch and pull Jin down with a German suplex to score the win. So DBA manages to keep his Horror Slam deathmatch title even after some outside interference. To Horror Slam we go now for DBA's second deathmatch title defense. It took place on August 11th at their Bloody Nights event. The challenger would be none other than Tommy Trainwreck. Trainwreck tried to introduce a fork bat at the start of this match, but DBA had other plans, sending the forks flying all over the ring. After the fork bat didn't quite work out for Tommy, he tried again, this time with a gusset plate bat, but once again, DBA took it right from him and made him pay. Looking like T-ball practice here, DBA hit a home run with a ball that was stuck into Tommy's head. Let's call a spade a spade here. It did not appear to be Tommy's night because he would also go on to miss this light tube shot set up in the corner. Just trying to get some type of offense in, DBA foiled him yet again and again. Trainwreck did get a few shots in, but in reality, this was all the champion here. I mean, he did spit on DBA, which proved to be a bad idea in itself. It would be a flaming elbow later, and that would be it for Trainwreck. DBA retains and leaves still your Horror Slam Deathmatch Champion. On September 8th at the Horror Slam Murder City Deathmatch Cup 2, the Deathmatch Champion DBA was scheduled to face his son, Malcolm Monroe III, in the opening round of the tournament. Before the match, DBA announced that he was putting the title on the line as well as his deathmatch career. They fought all over the ringside area, seeing MM3 take a nasty looking powerbomb through a TV screen. Then after stapling several dollars to each other, DBA left his son squealing like a pig with a shot down low. Not ready to face the music just yet, DBA fought hard for his title and his career here. 
He about split MM3 in half with this toss into the corner through a wooden beam. Climbing up to the top rope, DBA lit his elbow pad on fire and drove it down through the heart of his son, but shockingly, it would not be enough. MM3 snatched his dad's bandana doused it in chloroform, and shoved it into his face. Just before he fell asleep, he flipped his father up and planted him down with a double underhook powerbomb to pick up that win. Malcolm Monroe III is the new Horror Slam Deathmatch Champion, and he has put an end to his father's deathmatch career. We got a little bonus history with this match here, and you know what? It was a great career, so let's celebrate that. On the same night, the new champion, Malcolm Monroe III, made it to the finals of the Murder City Deathmatch Cup 2, where he would face Chuck Stein. Just like his dad did in the opening round, MM3 got on the mic, saying he wanted to up the odds, making this match for both the Murder City Deathmatch Cup number 2 and the Horror Slam Deathmatch title. With light tubes surrounding the ring, these two had glass flying all over the place. After some gusset plates were rammed into Chuck's head on both sides of his mohawk, he broke out a handful of needles, much to the crowd's delight. He proceeded to shove three of the syringes into the arm of MM3. And that's where Malcolm returned the favor by holding Chuck's hand down with his foot and driving the remaining syringes into his hand. It was grotesque, it was horrifying, and the fans loved every second of it. Dealing with just one hand now, Chuck was in trouble, but he wasn't out just yet. He countered a suplex through a wooden board and light tubes, driving MM3 down and to the mat. He quickly made the cover, scored that three count victory, getting the win. Chuck Stein has won the Murder City Deathmatch Cup number two and won the Horror Slam Deathmatch title for a record fifth time. Horror Slam hosted their Halloween after party on November 3rd, and in that main event, we saw Chuck Stein put his newly won deathmatch title on the line up against uncivil Satu Jin and the Iron. It's Iron. You don't pronounce it Iron. <laughs> That's what everybody no, tells me. It's the Iron Horse. Like Luke Derrick was the Iron Horse of baseball. Yes. The word I-R-O-N is Iron. iron. No, no, Iron. 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 Cast iron grilling grates you, that are, are rebel. when you say Iron? Uh, you know what? Don't be like fucking Larry King. That motherfucker. Yes, the Iron Demon, Shane Mercer. The champ was jumped right away here, being double teamed by the challengers. That included a military press into a Samoan drop through some glass. With Stein out of the way, Jin and Mercer went at it, with Mercer proving why he is unmatched in strength in the entire scene. Chuck would try to make his way back into the match later, but Jin shut that down real quick. The back and forth would continue between Jin and Mercer. That's when Mercer propped Satu Jin up on the top rope and shattered a full pane of glass over his back. Don't worry though, Jin would later get even on the outside of the ring. Wow, the struggles really continued for the champ here, but at least we got some fun fan participation as well. It would be quite a while, but eventually Chuck did get some solid offense in, and it was, of course, once he turned to his trusted barbed wire baseball bat. Just real quick, I want to point out one of my favorite things about this match was Satu Jin just randomly showing up and catching people with light tubes in the back on the outside of the ring. I don't know, I just think it added to the non-stop destruction that this match pretty much had going throughout. Back in the ring though, Jin would eat a Death Valley driver onto some tubes, followed by Mercer taking a DVD himself, then Chuck caught Jin with a sling blade to secure the victory. Chuck Stein makes his first successful title defense on his fifth reign as Horror Slam Deathmatch Champion. And as always, I want to say thank you to Hard Cam Frio for this footage. You can find this match in full on his YouTube channel right now. Go check it out. Horror Slam hosted a Christmas horror story on December 29th, and in the main event, Chuck Stein would defend his Horror Slam Deathmatch Championship against the inaugural champion, Peter B. Beautiful. They started things off outside of the ring where light tubes came into play, but it was a staple gun that really started the craziness. Shout out to Hard Cam Frio for this extreme close up of Peter getting a $20 bill stapled to his tongue and then ripping it out. That wouldn't be the only brutal spot in this match either. Chuck took a barbed wire cricket bat right to the side of the head. Take a listen. Oh! Then they broke out of the syringes where we first saw Peter getting two right through his cheeks. 
Then Chuck got him shoved straight into his arms. If that wasn't bad enough, we saw another extreme close-up of the champ getting his bottom lip stuck to the turnbuckle with a needle. Oh yeah, and more syringes just shoved into his arms. After a couple panes of glass were shattered, they made their way over to the ring apron where a big light tube setup was on the floor below. They both ended up falling through this contraption and failed to answer the rest 10 count. At the time, the match was called a double count out, but Peter begged the ref to start the match. So guess what? It was restarted. But then immediately after that, Chuck went buck wild on Peter with light tubes, and then he locked in this cross face with his trusty barbed wire baseball bat. Peter had to tap out, meaning that Chuck Stein leaves 2023 still the Horror Slam Deathmatch Champion. How many death matches have you seen take place in a water park? My answer is one, <laughs> this one. Because on February 5th, Dmitry Alexandrov would defend his WrestleRave Deathmatch Championship in a home run derby deathmatch against Stud Stash for Baracho Pro Wrestling at their Violence at Volente event. As you would probably imagine, there were several different ultra-violent bats being used in this match, but I'll say I didn't imagine a razor blade bat being used. Stud Stash happened to find a couple of syringes, I guess just buried out in the sand at the Valente Beach Resort, and he used them to stick through the cheeks of the champion. Even after taking a ton of punishment from his bigger challenger, Dimitri was able to take advantage of his opponent's lack of stamina to catch him with a bundle of tubes to the head. Then he muscled him up onto his shoulder to drive him down through a door and light tubes to take home the win. Dimitri's first successful deathmatch title defense of 2023 is in the books. Texas-based Wrestle Rave held their show Winter Wham on February 18th. And on that show, Dmitry Alexandrov put his Wrestle Rave Deathmatch Championship on the line against Dr. Redacted. Alexandrov is the first ever Wrestle Rave Deathmatch Champion. And he's held the title since August of last year, but he had quite the challenge set up for him here. All right, we just got to say it. Dr. Redacted has plenty of charisma to go around and isn't afraid to let his voice be heard. Hey, you're damn right. I was going fucking fast, you stupid son of a bitch. These two battled all around the venue, seeing Alexandrov put the doctor through a door, and then what I like to see, we got to see some innovative uses of the light tubes. Things started to come to an end when it looked like Dr. Redacted started shoving a pin or a syringe or some type of needle. Couldn't really see what it was, but it was going right into the eye of Alexandrov and used that to get the advantage. The doctor then gave him a DVD through the light tube door, followed by a nice curb stomp to get the victory. So there it is, our only title change of the month. Dr. Redacted is your new Wrestle Rave Deathmatch Champion. I've seen that Wrestle Rave's Death Triad 2 tournament is coming up in late April, so it's going to be interesting to see how long the Doctor can hold on to that title. Dr. Redacted's first Wrestle Rave Deathmatch title defense would take place in Los Angeles over WrestleMania weekend at Crimson Crown Wrestling's Violent World event. His first challenger would be no easy task, as he would have to take on Casanova Valentine. Seconds after the bell, Cass took advantage with a huge belly-to-belly -belly overhead suplex, and then Redacted tried to escape out of the ring, but he caught a cactus elbow straight to the heart. Redacted was probably better off inside the ring, though, because maybe he missed the memo. Few wrestlers can even come close to touching Valentine in no ring combat. But something tells me I think he finally got that memo midway through this match, though. Up until this miscue, Valentine put in 100% of the offense. But that was the opening the murder surgeon needed because he would break out some skewers and drive them into the cheek of his challenger. And it may have been a little cocky on his part, but the champ took a lap around the ring to finally come back and drive a chair into the face of Cass. This match was actually a little on the short side, totaling just over six minutes long, but it was action-packed from Bell to bell. Now I gotta point something out here. Redacted was extremely lucky as he took another belly to belly suplex into a pane of glass which was not tempered and could easily have cut him in half. Just when Valentine was about to hit his claw slam, Redacted caught him twice in the gut with a taser. He was then able to easily finish him off with a big frog splash from the top rope. He took a hell of a beating out there but Dr. Redacted gets that first successful title defense out of the way. Then we came to our final three-way of round number one. We had the Deathmatch Hall of Famer, Madman Pondo. He came out to face Remington Roar, who, by the way, came out dual-wielding machetes. And their opponent was the current WrestleRave Deathmatch champion, Dr. Redacted. 
This match pretty much saw it all. I'm talking Roar using his actual machete, smashing cinder blocks over Pondo's back, Redacted using himself like a human wrecking ball, Pondo pulling out a knife, carving up Roar's head, and then using that same knife in the doctor's mouth. Pondo driving Redacted's head down into the light tubes. Roar slamming Redacted onto a chair and light tubes. Roar military pressing Redacted through a door and... I mean, I, I think you're sensing a pattern here. Yeah, Redacted took a beating. And the crazy thing was, all of this was before an elimination. The first elimination came after Pondo laid another cinder block over the head of Remington Roar before smashing it with a sledgehammer. I mean, wow, yes, Roar was easily eliminated at that point. But then right after that, Redacted was able to hit a great looking frog splash to then pin and beat the Hall of Famer. That means Dr. Redacted advances to the finals and will be taking his deathmatch title with him. Speaking of those finals, we saw Dmitry Alexandrov take on Hoodfoot and the deathmatch champ, Dr. Redacted. I'm not kidding when I say this match started out with a bang, with Redacted catching Alexandrov off guard during the ring announcements. This finals kind of resembled Suplex City here because everybody was getting a ton of offense in. Later on into the match though, after taking a scary looking powerbomb to the outside of the ring, something kind of weird happened. Dimitri gave Hoodfoot a clothesline and would go for a pin attempt and the ref counted to three, but that was after Hoodfoot got his shoulder up. The crowd was obviously angry that Hoodfoot was wrongly eliminated here, and he smashed some light tubes over the ref Killian's back before leaving the ring. With that surprise elimination, that means the Death Triad 2 winner was down between Redacted and Alexandrov. We got to see some solid brawling and high risk take place outside of the ring, but eventually they fought their way back in for the bloodshed to come to a close. It wasn't the fisherman's suplex through light tubes. It wasn't a DVD through a door. It wasn't even Redacted's frog splash in the match. It was Matt Locke running in to low blow Alexandrov, setting him up for an absolutely brutal looking curb stomp to finally end the match. Redacted sat on Dimitri's chest, picking up the three count and the Death Triad 2 win. He walked into the Death Triad 2, your Wrestle Rave Deathmatch champion, and Dr. Redacted walks out with the title still in his possession. Let's go down to Houston now for Wrestle Rave's second anniversary spectacular, where Dmitry Alexandrov would receive his final shot at Dr. Redacted's Deathmatch Championship in the main event. Literally kicking things off with light tubes, it was not long before Dmitry drove a gusset plate into the champ's head, only to knock it off with a cookie sheet. Alexandrov took his eyes off the doctor for just one second and ate a bunch of tubes because of it. Per usual, Redacted proved that one of the most deadly weapons in his matches is his own body. As he slammed himself into his challenger several times, no fans or chairs were safe as the two brawled out into the ringside area. Like the true professional he is, Redacted pulled out his stethoscope, putting it into the ears of Dimitri and screamed into it, trying to make the man's eardrums explode. Now that, my friends, is hardcore. And just about as hardcore as Redacted almost impaling himself onto this chair. I'm not sure if I've ever seen a scissor bat before, but I'm going to have to agree with commentary on this one. Oh, hell no. Then looking to murder his challenger, Redacted brought him down face first into chairs and tubes. With that somehow not being enough, he then hit a frog splash onto tubes, and guess what? That also was not enough. Redacted tried his luck one too many times and blinded himself with the trash can, costing himself big. With desperation setting in, Dimitri connected with his trademark slam off the turnbuckles and then smashed several light tubes over the exposed neck of the champ. It would take one final slam onto the trash can to finally keep the doctor down for the three count. Dimitri Alexandrov, the first ever WrestleRave Deathmatch Champion, is now the first ever two-time Deathmatch Champion. The main event at Wrestle Rave's Ghoul's Night Out saw a Monsters Ball match with the Deathmatch Champion Dmitry Alexandrov trying to fend off three challengers. We're talking Funny Bone, Wesley Crane, and Eric Dillinger. 
This match would see nearly 30 minutes of ultra violence with everyone looking like the favorite to win at points. Funny Bone would staple everyone in the groin and I mean everyone. Dillinger would travel coast to coast. Crane would hit some of the stiffest shots in the entire match. And Alexandrov would use bodies to eliminate steel chairs. But I guess then again, everybody would also look like they had no chance to win this match. Like when Wesley Crane took a shopping cart ride to his near death. Dillinger would eat a coup de gras through a big ass door. Alexandrov would be DVD'd onto a pile of thumbtacks. And we can't forget about that package pile driver Funny Bone took through another big ass door. And all of that was before light tubes were even introduced into this thing. You know what? You really do need to load this show up on IWTV to see everything because there's just way too much to put in this quick recap here. Bodies were broken in half. Syringes were broke out at one point. There were frog splashes from hell and so, so much more. Now, eventually, Dillinger would prematurely light his victory cigar, thinking he was about to finish off the champion, but Dimitri snatched his stogie and put it out on his chest. All that was left to do was to drive Dillinger down through even more light tubes off the top rope to secure the win. This was an absolute war, and honestly, it was my favorite death match of the year from WrestleRave, so do yourself a favor, go check it out. I promise you won't be disappointed. Heading to Houston, Texas now, WrestleRave held their Holiday Havoc event on December 16th with Dmitry Alexandrov defending his WrestleRave Deathmatch Championship against Sky De La Cremosa in the main event. With the holiday spirit on full display, these two would begin by beating each other with Stana's cookie sheets, and I'm pretty sure those were children's presents. Dimitri took a nasty spill onto the ring apron, allowing Sky to staple ribbons and a couple dollar bills to the champ. Then after being choked out by some tinsel, a small sickle was used to carve into Alexandrov's forehead. Just when he thought he was getting even with this gusset plate wreath, Sky whipped out a couple of spiked baseball bats and really tried to force the champ to tap out. Several more presents were opened up around the ring with various weapons inside, including these thumbtacks, which Alexandrov ended up powerbombing his challenger onto. Sky would later chokeslam Dimitri directly onto this barbed wire Christmas tree. He would then take a bundle of tubes to the side before being hoisted up onto Alexandrov's shoulders, where the champ would march him over to the other side of the ring, slamming him down onto another pile of tubes. That right there would be enough to keep Sky De La Cremosa down for the three count. Dimitri Alexandrov closes out the year the same way he started it as the Wrestle Rave Deathmatch Champion. The XPW King of the Deathmatch Champion Schlack would step into a no ropes barbed wire match with one of the top deathmatch legends still going today, the Necro Butcher. Or the MAGA Butcher as he goes by today. As Schlack came from the back, Necro blindsided him to jumpstart this match. Before even stepping foot in the ring, these two brawled all over the Hart Ballroom, seeing Schlack drive a spike into the bloody forehead of the Butcher. The guardrails were even dismantled as pure chaos broke out around the fans. Once they finally did get into the ring, Necro started to work the leg of Schlack, very textbook work by the way, that we were seeing on display here. But then the downfall came because as Necro was looking to continue his focus on Schlack's legs, Schlack shoved him off. Necro fell back through the barbed wire, taking a nasty spill on the concrete floor. As Staff and his entourage rushed over to check on him, it was pretty obvious that Necro was not in a good way. Trying to buy Necro some time to recover, Schlack beat up on one of his cronies, Danny Maga Ramirez. Eventually, Butcher was able to get back into the ring, but was immediately locked into an armbar. Somehow he was able to lock in a figure four after Schlack's knee gave out on him, and this prompted Hardcore Hillbilly to get into the ring and start diving onto their legs, trying to get the champ to submit. Seeing enough of this three-on-one, or four-on-one if you count Jasmine, Masada came out from the back to even the odds with a chair. This KO shot to the MAGA Butcher would be all she wrote, though, giving Schlack the win. The Faces of Death reunite as Schlack ended up launching Jasmine St. Clair out of the ring to end the night. At Horror Slam's Blood Kings event on February 24th, Schlack put his XPW King of the Death Matches title on the line against John Wayne Murdoch. This match was nuts. The crowd saw just as much glass as the wrestlers did. Schlack always does a great job bringing chaos into a match, and this match to me was the epitome of chaos. Not that I was keeping track or anything, but after the month of February, I'm pretty sure this match had the most light tubes used. They just kept coming and coming and coming and... 
Yeah, I think you get the idea. There was a point where Schlack was going up to the top rope and Murdoch just drills him with some light tubes. You could just see them go flying straight into the crowd. I may be wrong here, but the fans sounded pretty happy and my guess is they wouldn't want to have it any other way. One little nugget I want to point out is in the middle of all this chaos, as I describe it, Schlack decides he's going to work the arm. I, I love that. And then on top of all this craziness going on, Schlack decked the referee with his title only to get taken advantage of by Murdoch. Can you imagine if a belt shot ended the match after all this? I love the false finish here where Murdoch thought he won the title, but Schlack put his foot on the bottom rope, leaving the ref not to call the three count. Schlack then decked Murdoch and slammed even more light tubes down on top of his face to pick up that win. After a few choice words, John Wayne Murdoch exited the ring and I think the fans went home happy that night. We are heading back to XPW now to cover the king of the Deathmatch Championship match between Schlack, the champion, taking on Atticus Koger, the challenger. Just to be clear, this match was called a sky-high, double-wire, double-glass, total-hell deathmatch. So, you know, no big deal or anything. Schlack started things off a little technical with working the leg of Koger, then quickly transitioned into grinding his face into the barbed wire. Atticus would jump off the middle portion of the scaffold onto Schlack while wrapped in barbed wire pretty much. They would fight around the ring a while, seeing Schlack get the better of his challenger at some points, and then others Koger would gain the upper hand, so it kind of went back and forth. Though Schlack never looked like he was in trouble until Koger slammed him down off the ring apron through a barbed wire contraption on the floor. Once they got back into the ring, Schlack got caught up on even more barbed wire and out came Koger skewers. But we didn't just get one clump shoved into his head. We got a whole party pack. With Schlack literally being tortured in front of the fans, I love how one dude from the crowd yells, Hey Schlack, are you all right? Deathmatch wrestling fans, man, let me tell you. So eventually a multi-layered doors, light tubes, and panes of glass table was constructed and Schlack began climbing up the scaffold that was set up on the side of the ring. At first, Atticus didn't want to climb up the scaffold, but then Schlack chucked the light tube down with absolute precision, busting over his face. Once on top of the scaffold, they traded some light tube shots and then Schlack snatched Koger up and jumped off the scaffold with him. And wow, we got a big epic finish here to close out the match. Slack got the win and is still your XPW King of the Deathmatch champion. Next up, we are heading back over to XPW to the King of the Deathmatch tournament where Drake Younger won. Well, he won the trophy, not the title, because Schlack is the champion, and he came out immediately during the ceremony, told Drake that this tournament was never for the trophy. It was all about his title. And then he proceeded to destroy the trophy right there in front of Drake. So yeah, after winning three death matches in one night, Drake's prize was really a title match against XPW's King of the Deathmatch champion, Schlack. This match would also be a ladder match with a title being suspended up above one of the two rings. They immediately started fighting out into the crowd where Schlack caught Drake coming off of some tables and just slammed him down onto some nearby chairs. As soon as they got back into the ringside area, it looked like Drake took some tubes directly into the face. Actually, it kind of looked like there were several reckless looking light tubes being thrown around in this thing. Drake would set up a couple tables in the second ring with a pane of glass on top. That's when Schlack would eventually make his way up to the top of the ladder, retrieve his title to win the match, but as he did, Drake shoved the ladder over, sending Schlack crashing down through the tables on the other ring. That was without a doubt an awesome visual, and Schlack gets the win, retaining his title, but sadly, other than some light tube shots and the big fall from the ladder, there wasn't a whole lot here. I mean, you may want to take into consideration this was Drake's fourth death match of the night, and this was right at the seven hour mark of the show. So yeah, it is what it is. The XPW King of the Deathmatch Champion Schlack was stuck right in the middle of the Horror Slam vs. GCW4 event on May 19th. And he would be putting his title up against Horror Slam mainstay Remington Roar. This match pretty much saw two brutes looking to beat the hell out of each other. Before long, these guys were on the outside of the ring delivering clubbing light tube blows to one another. And it seems like these hits would just not stop coming either. Chairs and light tubes would prove to be the weapons of choice in this match. Well, that and Roar's machete that he used in a cross face. I may be wrong here, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say he is the first person to pull off a machete cross face. After jockeying for position here, Slack drove Roar down through more light tubes in a chair with a Samoan drop to put him away for the three count. 
It was a hard-hitting and expectedly bloody affair, but Schlack leaves Horror Slam successfully defending his XPW King of the Deathmatch title. On May 27th, Schlack would put his King of the Deathmatch title on the line for the second time this month, but this time it was at XPW's Broken, Beaten, Scarred. His opponent was a man looking to make a statement, and that was Kit Osborne. Unfortunately for Kit, or fortunately, depending on how you look at this, this match did not last much more than five minutes but it was five minutes of pure chaos. Kit jump-started the match, slamming a bundle of light tubes into the face of Slack on the outside of the ring that only seemed to piss the champ off. Because he would proceed to manhandle Kit, launching him back into some tubes in the corner. He then hit one of the most ruthless-looking pile drivers you will see this month. All fired up, Slack would then lock in a nice submission attempt, and sure, go ahead and throw in some finger-biting while you're at it. This beatdown did briefly come to an end after Schlack missed a diving elbow from the top, because Kit just did his best to mount some type of offense, slamming light tube after light tube on the champ to try and just keep him down, but to no avail. Schlack landed a brutal looking Polish hammer and then dropped Kit on the back of his head before finishing him off with another clubbing blow. Like I said, this match was pretty quick, but it was extremely hard hitting and Kit was left a bloody mess. The year plus reign as XPW King of the Deathmatch champion continues as we head into the summer. On June 24th at XPW's problematic event, Schlack would put his King of the Deathmatches championship on the line against British top team's Big Lou Nixon. Schlack tried to score several quick pinfall attempts, but with no luck, and maybe that would have been the best thing for Nixon because he would be creamed with tons and tons of just wild light tube shots throughout this match. It did look like he got a couple payback shots though with his lethal kicks. There would be several scary moments in this match, just like the Samoan drop, just deleting this chair with light tubes on top of it. Somehow nobody lost an eye with this right here. There was also this table set up at ringside which just wouldn't seem to break. The carnage would mercifully come to an end though, when Schlack just chucked a bunch of light tubes at Lou before clotheslining him to get the win. It definitely wasn't pretty, but they don't call him the human meat grinder for nothing. Schlack leaves problematic still the XPW King of the Death Matches champion. At the XPW show titled I Hope You Die, Schlack would defend the King of the Death Matches championship against the body. Now, this wasn't as much of a match as it was a one-sided massacre. Schlack would just throw the body around the ring like a sack of potatoes and at one point even powerbombed him directly on the top of his head. There was just absolutely no chance for the body to win this match. He was treated like a lifeless dummy all throughout this thing. The only real offense he got off was when he kissed Schlack and shoved him down onto a razor board and then followed that up with an elbow drop from the top. But seriously, that was it. Schlack would hit an Alabama slam onto that same razor board and then would lock in a super deep looking Boston Crab forcing the body to tap out. Not satisfied with that quick finish, Schlack brought a large wooden X into the ring and ended up strapping the body to it. He pinned the body up in the corner, pelting him with light tube shot after light tube shot, giving him a pretty bad cut directly under his chin. Schlack put the cherry on top of this thing, or a barbed wire crown of thorns, you know, same thing, as he exited the ring, still champion, with another dominating victory. Oh, I almost forgot, he threw in one last belt shot to the head, I guess just for good measure. XPW's Halloween in Hell 4 took place on October 29th, and in that main event, Schlack defended both his XPW world title as well as his King of the Death Matches title against a returning homeless Jimmy. In fact, the last time that Jimmy stepped foot in XPW was all the way back in 2009, and here he comes walking in to face one of the most dangerous deathmatch wrestlers on the entire planet. Jimmy tried his best to keep up with the human meat grinder, but Schlack brutalized him from the get-go. Getting pretty desperate here, the challenger tried to pull off a high-risk maneuver and nearly knocked himself out cold on the floor, falling head first. And no, Schlack would not let up either by immediately double stomping glass down onto the back of his head. Stop! Stop! He's already dead! Even just a simple boot rake turned into the stomp here, leading to Jimmy snapping, going all in on the champ. Maybe it was from the blood loss, maybe it was from the exhaustion, or maybe it was from some concussions, but whatever the plan was here for Homeless Jimmy, it didn't quite pan out. Suddenly, Eric Ryan came down to the ring with a bundle of light tubes to take Schlack out, but he missed drilling Homeless Jimmy in the face, 
leading to his pinfall. Eric Ryan didn't seem to care either way, but Schlack leaves Halloween in Hell 4, still your XPW King of the Death Matches champion. In Brandon Kirk's first title defense of 2023, he put the title up against the first ever champion, John Wayne Murdoch. Early on, Murdoch dominated the start of this thing until Kirk had enough and went completely fucking nuts, destroying Murdoch with every single light tube he could get his hands on. Eventually, Casey Kirk jumped into the ring to help her husband out, but Murdoch was having none of that. The distraction proved to be just enough for Brandon to take back control of the match later on, hitting the Psycho Driver Fuck! your life and with that brandon pin murdoch scoring a massive successful title defense just a side note here after the match murdoch said that he wouldn't be coming back too often to no holds barred so i mean that's really disheartening here i don't know what it's about he didn't elaborate he kind of just jumped out of the ring but that's gonna be a pretty big blow to the roster going forward. ICW No Holds Bar did a little weekend tour in the UK this month, and in all three events, Brandon Kirk put his title on the line. First up at the Volume 41 show, Kirk issued an open challenge to anybody on the Rise Underground roster to come out and take a shot at his belt. B.A. Rose accepted that challenge, and these two put on a heck of a match, especially for being under 10 minutes. In fact, this is the first time that I've seen B.A. Rose, and I'm pretty impressed. A Weed Whacker was actually brought into the match, but the champ was able to duck under it and use it against Rose. The crazy thing is I feel like the blind chair shot from behind hurt just as bad, if not worse. And then kudos to Kirk for getting the big man up for a massive Psycho Driver! Fuck your life! And that was the first title defense of the weekend under his belt in a solid, quick match. The next night at the Volume 42 event, Brandon Kirk put his ICW American Deathmatch Championship on the line, as well as his H2O Danny Havoc Hardcore title against Clint Margera. And wouldn't you know it, we got another really good title match here. Like I said, the ICW title was on the line, but the Danny Havoc title really was the focus of this match, technically making it become a world title after this. There were a lot of light tube shots to the head here, as well as a handful of kisses. Things got a little wild, what can I tell you? After some quality hybrid wrestling here, Brandon Kirk planted Margera with his psycho driver, fuck your life, to score the win. Then for the third night in a row, Brandon Kirk put his ICW American Deathmatch belt on the line against a man who had quite the month, Lou Nixon. And let me tell you this right now, the fans really did show their hatred towards Lou. I mean, he wasn't helping himself. He destroyed the big light tube sword they all wanted to see used in. Man, what a heel. But the fans did get to see Kirk use the big light tube nunchucks against him. So, I mean, that was pretty good. The end came when both guys started climbing up to the top rope and fan favorite Carl Barma threw powder into Lou's eyes. When Lou temporarily blinded, Brandon was able to choke slam him through a light tube table to get that win. So if you're keeping track of those stats at home, that would be three straight ICW American Deathmatch Championship title offenses, Brandon Kirk, plus one H2O Danny Havoc hardcore title defense not a bad February for the champ. Brandon Kirk put his ICW American Deathmatch World Championship on the line in the opening match at No Holds Barred's Volume 43 show. Right off the bat, during Akira's entrance, he was low blowed from behind by Casey Kirk. Brandon looked around, looked a little confused. He didn't know what was going on, but then turned heel right in front of our eyes. After last year's Kirk storyline, they became fan favorites everywhere they went but it looks like times are changing. Actually, there wasn't a whole lot to this match with it coming in around four minutes long, but I don't know, it came off more as an angle than it did a match. Brandon would beat on and choke Akira on the outside of the ring before tossing him back in, where Akira did try to make a comeback. Just when it looked like the tides were about to turn, Brandon shoved the ref into the chains, catching Akira in a bad place. That is where KC Kirk lit him up in the face with a light tube bundle, setting up the psycho driver, fuck your life, and that was all she wrote, folks. Casey got on the mic and she screamed about how her husband is the best deathmatch wrestler alive. And, well, she got this response. With this match in the books, it looks like we have officially left the Love the Kirks era to enter the Fuck the Kirks era. They love the Kirks here in Chattanooga. Then the next week at ICW No Holds Barred Pit Fighter X16, Brandon put the ICW American Deathmatch title on the line once again, this time against Neil Diamond Cutter. 
Now, keep in mind, this was Neil's first weekend back after breaking his arm back in January. And also, this was Brandon's first match as a fresh new heel. The match clocked in in less than 10 minutes, but you know what? That's okay. I think this was one of Brandon's best title matches under this reign as champ. That's just an opinion, though, so don't kill me. Um, from the match introductions, Brandon jumped Neil from behind, almost taking out the cameraman in the process. The champ put Neil through a couple of doors, and let me tell you right now, bad guy Brandon was in full effect here. Eventually, Neil found his staple gun and wound up stapling about $20 worth of the fans' cash onto Brandon's body. I do want to point out that I love the move from Brandon to shove some cash into his pocket before stapling more bills to Neil. They moved on to some devastating-looking maneuvers onto some chairs, and when I say devastating, I mean Brandon hit probably the best-looking psycho driver fuck your life right here. Send him, young man! Psycho driver fuck your life! What? Only for Neil to kick out at two. As Brandon threw a fit, the unthinkable happened next. No, 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 no. Ooh. With that fucking fast count bullshit. There it is, your winner and new ICW American Deathmatch World Champion, Neil Diamond Cutter. Brandon snatched up a microphone as well as referee shiny shoes and yelled at him about the fast count and told him to restart the match. After he did call for the bell to restart the match, Brandon hit another brutal looking psycho driver fuck your life, this time to score the win. It was a good old dusty finish it appears. And it worked like a charm, I'm not gonna lie. It got the fans all riled up. They even started throwing some trash into the pit. And afterwards, Hoodfoot jumped into the pit, setting up the next title defense against him at volume 45 in April. That makes for two more title defenses for Brandon after the month of March. And when you look at it, I think he's putting together quite a big run here. Now let's see how April treats him. Fuck you. Oh. <laughs> ICW No Holds Barred Volume 45 show, the now full-blown heel Brandon Kirk showed up wearing some all-white cult-like outfit. Meanwhile, the challenger Hoodfoot showed up with the entire crowd supporting him that never let up through the entire match. And that's a good thing because early on in this match, Hoodfoot took a ton of damage with Brandon completely controlling the match. He even took a bad fall through what had to be maybe two dozen, three dozen light tubes. Eventually, Brandon had Hoodfoot pinned down right where he wanted him, and he called for Casey to hand him the same knife that he held to Hoodfoot's throat last month. And then straight out of a horror movie, Cruel emerged from the back, grabbing Casey, who may be the next pro wrestling scream queen. You gotta be fucking kidding me. Dude, this is fucking... And there she went. With the distraction, Hoodfoot grabbed the knife, threatening to use it on Kirk, but took a low blow instead. Brandon snatched up the knife again and held it up to Hoodfoot's throat, forcing the ref to call the match before things got out of hand. Well, so we thought. With the fans thinking that Kirk snuck away with the win yet again, they started chucking a bunch of trash into the ring, completely pissed off. That was until Danny DeMonto came out and restarted the match, which happens to be the exact opposite of what happened last month to Neil Diamond Cutter. Referee Shiny Shoes drilled Brandon in the face with light tubes, and then Hoodfoot quickly hit the psycho driver, fuck your life, onto the champ, picking up the win, becoming the new ICW American Deathmatch World Champion. The crowd absolutely loved it. Everyone came out from the back. It really did have this special moment feel. But there you have it, your new champion, Hoodfoot Mo Atlas. Now the very next night at RPW Street Trash Show, Hoodfoot was already scheduled to take on John Wade Murdoch, so why not make it for his newly won title? Hoodfoot rocked the referee shirt in this match in support of his fallen friend, referee SPO. As expected, this match was so damn good. We saw several different smaller panes of glass used as compared to the larger sizes that we normally see, so it was a little different change of pace. One spot that looked particularly scary was when Hoodfoot's head was up against this pane of glass and Murdoch brought his knee down onto his head, smashing that glass. Then in this simple move here, Hoodfoot had a chunk of his arm ripped up, or at least his skin was torn. Yeah, you can see it really good here, flopping around after the suplex. They also used razor boards and doors in devastating fashion as well. 
These two have been on another level this year, and with this being their seventh matchup against each other, you can tell they've built up quite the chemistry. And in case you were curious, yes, they are tied at three wins apiece against each other, with that other match being another person that won. Because here, Hoodfoot picked up the win after two backdrop drivers making his first successful title defense. This was easily one of my favorite matches of the month. We have now fully entered the deathmatch title reign of Hoodfoot. With ICW no holds barred, having to call an audible on their UK tour plans, we find ourselves at the Volume 46 show rolling with the punches. That is where the champion Hoodfoot put his title up against a member of the Rejects, Reed Bentley. And you know what? The former American Deathmatch champion completely dominated Hoodfoot the whole first half of this match. He ended up using light tubes, thumbtack bats, panes of glass, firecracker chairs, and he even used mittens and then his own body at times to dish out punishment to the champ. Bentley even got the better of some barroom brawling on the outside. Finally, Hoodfoot did get some offense in with some glass before we saw both men go crashing off the ring apron through a large pane of glass in a flaming door. Bentley even caught on fire for a second there, and then it also looked like he may have jacked up his elbow as well. Regardless, both men answered the 10 count, avoiding a double count out. And you know what? That may have been the best outcome for this match because after some more heavy hitting moves, we saw quite a bizarre ending. Bentley hit his hammerlock clothesline and fell on top of Hoodfoot hitting him clean in the middle of the ring. I can't imagine how this was a mistake on anybody's part and the crowd just booed and everybody looked around very confused. The ring announcer looked confused. Reed was named the new champion. Then out came Danny DeMonto and restarted the match because he said he wanted the fans to go home happy. With the match restarted, Hoodfoot hit a backdrop driver followed by a massive clothesline to the back of the head with some light tubes and then Hoodfoot won. So if you're keeping score at home, the last three months in a row had dusty finishes for the American Deathmatch title. First, it happened in March with Neil Diamond Cutter, then in April with Hoodfoot and Kirk, and now again in May with Hoodfoot and Reed. Either way, love it or hate it, Hoodfoot leaves the Volume 46 show still the champion. Next up, we head to Chicago for ICW No Holds Barred's Volume 47 show. That is where arguably Hoodfoot Mo Atlas would face his biggest challenge to his American Deathmatch title yet. He would have to defend against the Deathmatch legend tank, a fired up monster cruel, and the current six time BJW Deathmatch champion, Abdullah Kobayashi. Not an easy task. This ended up being a wild brawl scene. All four of these men battle all over Berwyn Eagles here. At one point, Hoodfoot drives a gusset plate into the chest of Cruel, and I love photographer Stepstool Sarah's reaction as he pulls it out and he keeps slamming it into his own chest. Meanwhile, in the ring, Tank would stick a fork into the forehead of Kobayashi. Yes, that is a metal fork. As everyone seemed to be headbutting light tubes into each other's heads, Cruel just came back into the ring and cleared house with a double choke slam. And I think that was the moment when they all realized they needed to team up and take Cruel out of the equation. Kobayashi and Cruel would go fight into the backstage area, leaving Tank and Hoodfoot in the ring. And that's where Hoodfoot was able to put Tank through a door with light tubes strapped onto it, allowing him to score the three count victory before anyone could break it up. Hoodfoot would start the weekend off with a successful title defense. The very next day at ICW No Holds Barred Volume 48 show, Hoodfoot would once again put his American Deathmatch Championship up against John Wayne Murdoch. This match would break their tie against each other. After seven matches in their career against one another, they came into this with three wins apiece. Somebody was gonna walk away with the advantage. Just in the first two minutes of this match, these two used at least a couple of cases of light tubes on one another, wasting absolutely no time. Like in their previous encounters, John Wayne Murdoch took full control of this match early on. He had Hoodfoot on the ropes or on the chains in this case. We even saw a relatively rare flying elbow from Murdoch driving the champ down through a door. Hoodfoot did start to turn things around though with a back body drop onto a pane of glass which was laying across a full box of light tubes. But not long after that, we saw Circle Six's Atticus and Otis Kogar running through the crowd and briefly run into the ring, throwing what I assume were Circle Six flyers into the air. I'm not sure exactly what it was. Both Hoodfoot and Murdoch chased them out of the arena, as well as some other wrestlers like Cruel, and even commentator Struggles got in on the chase. With the fans pretty much shocked and a little confused by what they just saw, Murdoch and Hoodfoot would have to re-jumpstart this match, 
firing everybody up. It looked like they were going to be trading some more light tube shots, but the champ went absolutely ballistic and destroyed Murdoch with them all. He then hit his backdrop driver, followed by his clothesline to the back of the head to knock Murdoch out cold. Hoodfoot picked up the three count victory and remains your ICW American Deathmatch World Champion, going up four wins to three over Murdoch lifetime. In his third title match this month, Hoodfoot put his American Deathmatch World title against a man he knows all too well, uncivil Satu Jin. This match took place at RPW's Take As Needed For Pain. Jin just kickstarted things off with a kendo stick which he used to pelt the champ all over the ring. Panes of glass were broken early here with a Russian leg sweep right here and then a fallen pane of glass from the top rope. After being suckered by Jin, Hoodfoot took a big Samoan drop onto the light tubes. Hoodfoot would get even though because he would take Jin's big blade and start slicing away at his forehead, much to the crowd's delight. We would see even more panes of glass used with a DVD from Jin and that was followed by a backdrop driver through two stacked panes of glass courtesy of the champ. It would take one big clothesline to the back of the head, though, to put Satu Jin away for the three count. Keep in mind, all three of these bloody and legitimately brutal successful title defenses happened over one weekend in June. But Hoodfoot had one more title defense in June, and that would be an ICW No Holds Barred Pit Fighter X-17 event on June 30th. With only one loss inside the chains, the ultra-violent enforcer Bobby Beverly was looking like a serious threat leaving Tennessee with the American Deathmatch World Championship. This match would end up being a slow brawl around the cage, with each competitor using every weapon they could get their hands on. After getting the blood flowing with trading gusset plates, Hoodfoot drove one more plate into the arm of Beverly. He would then grab a bottle of what looked like rubbing alcohol and poured it onto the Bev's fresh cuts. I don't know about you, but I just saw him tap out. There was some back and forth brawling until Beverly drove Hoodfoot through a door with a suplex. A beautifully designed pane of glass was brought into the ring, which Hoodfoot of course drove the challenger through with a rotating brain buster. That right there would be all she wrote as Hoodfoot picked up seemingly and also kind of surprisingly an easy victory. That would be four successful title defenses in total this month, and I'd call that pretty good month for Hoodfoot. Kicking off the month of July, Hoodfoot would put his ICW American Deathmatch World Championship on the line at ICW's No Holds Barred Volume 49 show. His opponent would be none other than the man who has been making waves all year long, Tommy Vendetta, and of course, he was flanked by Darren McCarty. There was a lot of trading going on in this match. First, it was light tubes, then it was chairs, then we had fists, and then it was even more light tubes. Vendetta would break out his trademark Legos and drive the champ's head down into them, but it would not be enough. Tommy shot Darren a shock look and then went to set up a door in the corner. Darren would jump in, squirt lighter fluid all over the door and light it up. Hoodfoot would flip the script though and slam Tommy through the burning door with his Saito suplex. Now you would think that would probably score the win for the champ, but nope. With Darren McCarty freaking out, he ended up getting ejected from the ringside area, but that would prove to be a distraction for Hoodfoot, with Tommy taking advantage, hitting three consecutive pile drivers. Surely we have a new champion after that. Nope. Now desperate, Tommy would set up a pane of glass and call for one more pile driver from the top rope. Hoodfoot would once again counter Vendetta, this time with a spinning suplex through the glass. And with that, the challenger Tommy Vendetta failed to kick out, making yet another successful title defense for Hoodfoot. Jumping to the end of July on the 28th, Hoodfoot's work was not done just yet. He would have yet another multi-title defense month with the second match coming at ICW No Holds Barred Volume 50 event. He would put that ICW American Deathmatch World Championship up against a GCW and H2O Hall of Famer, Low Life Louis Ramos. And the first light tubes used instantly sliced Louis up good on his forehead. He tried to answer with a gusset plate to Hoodfoot's head, but immediately regretted that decision. The champ kept the momentum going up and until Louis moved out of the way of a door and Hoodfoot wiped himself out. That's where Louis pulled out some type of tool and just started grinding away at his opponent's skull. 
Looking to end the match early, Louis would set up a bundle of light tubes across some chairs, but Hoodfoot would counter with his trademark Saido suplex. Hoodfoot would then hit another Saido suplex where Louis shot up and he started hawking up. And of course, you know what comes next, the big leg drop to the champ, but somehow he stayed alive. After missing a second leg drop, Christmas came early for Louis when Hoodfoot drilled him with an ornament bat a couple times here. Then it would be one final suplex to get the win and end the match. That is yet another match, another month, another successful title defense for Hoodfoot. ICW No Holds Barred and the champ Hoodfoot came to Detroit on August 5th to put the belt up against one of his best friends, Randy West. Randy tried to lock in her guillotine choke early, but Hoodfoot just tossed her off into a pane of glass in the corner like a gnat. There were several light tube shots on the outside of the ring, but none of them looked like they knocked out their opponent, like when Randy drove her knee directly into Hoodfoot's head right here. Hoodfoot would land a Saito suplex in the middle of the ring only for Randy to return the favor into the corner through a barbed wire pane of glass. She tried to lock the guillotine in one more time, but took a brain buster instead. She then yelled at Hoodfoot, saying that he was wasn't shit, but I don't think he happened to agree with her here. Getting desperate, she went for yet another guillotine, but this time it would cost her the match. Hoodfoot sent her crashing down headfirst through a large pane of glass to get that win. After the match, Randy's husband, Schwartzy, joined them in the ring for a big group hug just to show some love. On September 23rd in ICW No Hold Bards Volume 52 main event, Hoodfoot put the ICW American Deathmatch Championship on the line against the man that he took the title from all the way back in April, Brandon Kirk. Hoodfoot went to swing a couple of light tubes to start this thing out, but clearly Brandon was having none of that. As this fight spilled outside of the ring, Hoodfoot used Kirk's arms as a pin cushion for four gusset plates. Kirk got his revenge though with a back body drop, almost cutting the champ in half with a steel chair. In a little bit of a twist, Hoodfoot was the one to set six chairs up in the ring, looking to dish out Kirk's trademark move onto himself. But Brandon wouldn't be shown up with his own setup and landed the Psycho Driver! Fuck your life on the champ. Then we got a very rare kick out of that move, which led Brandon to lose his cool going straight for his knife. As referee Gina went to pull the knife away, he lost his cool yet again, shoving her down to the mat. That's when referee Shiny Shoes, who initially cost Kirk the title, ran out in her defense but was chucked right through them chains. As Kirk turned his attention back to Hoodfoot, Gina drilled him in the face with a bundle of light tubes. The champ immediately hit his Saito suplex and then blasted Brandon with a lariat into light tubes to score the victory. Hoodfoot retains and Brandon Kirk's luck with referees just cannot get any worse right now. On Friday the 13th, ICW No Holds Barred held their volume 53 show, which was main evented by the American Deathmatch champion Hoodfoot taking on the one and only Mickey Knuckles. When Mickey's involved, you know you're always in for a good time, and this was a fun mix of ultra-violence and a little bit of adult comedy. All the way through, though, the fans were treated to some suplexes on the outside, plenty of light tube shots, gusset plates, several ball bag grabs, fan interaction, brawling all over the arena, full-on concussion-inducing headbutts, barbed wire doors, and plenty more. Mickey would eat a couple clotheslines, but she showed no signs of slowing down, even after one to the back of the head. The only way the champ would be able to put Mickey away would be to hit this inverted pump handle slam. Ironically, the pump handle slam is Mickey's finisher too. But pay close attention to this kick out. It was very close, but referee Shiny Shoes signaled for the bell, match over. Hoodfoot's impressive reign continues on after a hard fought and a very close battle with Mickey Knuckles. No surprise here, the very next night, Hoodfoot found himself in the main event yet again, defending his ICW American Deathmatch World Championship at ICW. W No Holds Bars Volume 54 show. This time, his worthy opponent would be Pagano. Things started with some headlocks, but escalated quickly once the match poured outside of the ring. And look at this, Pagano just grabs his fan's beer can, bites into it, ripping the can apart, and carves it into Hoodfoot's forehead. Now that is some gnarly stuff. The champ had plenty of violence to dish out as well, though, as he hit some light tube headbutts and this DDT through a door. After a headbutt through a chair, the challenger caught Hoodfoot with a nice code breaker. He would also hit this like kind of jumping pile driver onto what looked like a tumbleweed of barbed wire. 
Pagano would push his luck one too many times after crashing and burning with this high risk move, leading to Hoodfoot's trademark, Saito Suplex, but it wouldn't be enough. He then connected with that pump handle slam maneuver, which apparently is going to be called the South Side Flosion to seal the victory. So yeah, it looks like Hoodfoot has brought out a new trademark maneuver, but the result remains the same. Multiple successful title offenses in one month here. Just an insane year for this man. This marks Hoodfoot's 12th title defense now as he has eclipsed over 200 days as champion. On November 18th, ICW No Holds Barred traveled back to Tennessee for their Volume 55 show. In the main event, we saw streamers come out for the challenger Dr. Redacted as he would be going up against the ICW American Deathmatch Champion. That would be Hoodfoot. We got a bulldog and some headbutts being traded as well as a couple light tube shots to get this thing started. After a little vote from the crowd, Hoodfoot would send the doctor barreling through a pane of glass in the corner. Redacted was able to catch Hoodfoot off guard and then leap off of a chair using his own body as a weapon through a door. That's when Redacted made a critical error here trying to use Hoodfoot's trademark Saito suplex against him. He would quickly be spiked down to the mat as a result. Now, as this match continued, I couldn't help but notice the dual new champ and still champ chance going throughout the crowd, something honestly we haven't really seen during Hoodfoot's reign so far up to this point. Feeling the support from the fans, the challenger placed an upside down forkboard onto the champ's chest and climbed up to the top of the perch. He used a ladder to drive those forks down into the skin of Hoodfoot. Looking to dig into his bag of tricks, Dr. Redacted tried to spray green mist into the face of Hoodfoot, but Hoodfoot fell for that before an RPW earlier this year. He blocked a miss by grabbing Redacted its face so it shot all into his hand. He hit Redacted with a barrage of strikes, but that was countered when Redacted grabbed his fist, opening it up and put that miscovered hand directly into Hoodfoot's face with an iron claw. But that wouldn't be enough to keep the champ down for good. And neither would this codebreaker or this massive frog splash here. The champ took everything Doc had and proved why he has held this title since April. That end would be right around the corner though. Hoodfoot got the better of this back and forth light tube duel and he followed that up with the south side flosion through a pane of glass. Ladies and gentlemen, Hoodfoot gets the win, retaining his title for a 13th time this year. After the match, Redacted asked for one more shot at the title. After a little bit of a push, Hoodfoot did accept the challenge. So next month in December, they're going to run this back. ICW No Holds Barred returned to the Hart Ballroom on December 16th for their Volume 56 event. In that show would be main evented by the ICW American Deathmatch Champion Hoodfoot defending against Dr. Redacted in their rematch from last month. No surprise here, Redacted jump-started the match by attacking the champ from behind with light tubes. Don't worry though, Hoodfoot would get revenge with this crazy suicide dive to the outside of the ring, catching Redacted and the fans off guard. Who pays Suicida from the jam? Redacted would keep the momentum up with his trademark cannonball on the outside, and if that was enough, he would go for another one off the chains to the outside. After a while, Hoodfoot would do a number on the dock's back with these light tubes. At one point, he pulled the scrubs up over his head and just went to town on his exposed skin. The challenger would later climb up to the perch, putting his trash can over his head, and he actually landed a dive on a Hoodfoot. He's with this thing so much this year that it's actually a surprise when he lands it. We then got this back and forth light tube headshot trade-off where Hoodfoot just got fired up even more. A stunner would put Hoodfoot down while Redacted capitalized with a flying headbutt and then a massive frog splash onto light tubes. But that just wouldn't be enough to get the win. Hoodfoot would rebound with his Saito suplex through a door in the corner. Then when a pane of glass got set up in the other corner of the ring, Redacted tried fighting Hoodfoot off with a gusset plate to the skull. The champ fired off a chair shot to the head and then climbed up the chains to grab onto Redacted to deliver a monster brain buster down through the glass. In a three count later, Hoodfoot retains yet again after an almost 20 minute blood battle here with the murder surgeon. At Battle of the Tough Guys on December 30th, Hoodfoot would be putting his ICW American Deathmatch title on the line in every single round of the tournament. So in round number one, he would be taking on Bojack inside the cage. 
This would be the epitome of that big hoss match with these two hitting some cage rattling slams. Hoodfoot tried time and time again to get Bojack up for his Ghostbuster, but failed almost every single time. The champ took about 90% of the punishment in this match, but he was able to dig down deep after bashing Bojack's head in. He would sidestep the challenger, sending him through the door in the corner, and then finally was able to get Bojack up for that Ghostbuster to secure the three count. Moving on to the second round, Hoodfoot would be defending his title this time against Christian Ross. Once again, Hoodfoot took the majority of the punishment here, eating a monster spear from Ross. A gusset plate and some stiff shots, though, would not keep the champ down for long. Now, the slam onto the chair, though, it looked like Hoodfoot fell on it very awkwardly, but he was able to keep going. He would connect with that Ghostbuster onto Ross through a door and multiple cinder blocks to snag the win, advancing to the third round. In the semifinals, Hoodfoot would put his title on the line against Kaplan. Now, this match right here, it would be quick. And when I say quick, I mean less than two minutes quick. Kaplan did land a lethal looking Larry here at the start of this match, but Hoodfoot kicked out. The champ immediately went for his Ghostbuster, but Kaplan got his shoulder up at one. Then right after that, he hit one more Ghostbuster through a door this time to put an end to the match. So just like that, Hoodfoot moves on to the finals to face the bracket buster, Jaden Newman. Like most of his matches in this tournament, Hoodfoot was taken down early and saw the challenger take full control of the match. Literally everything except that kitchen sink was tossed down onto Hoodfoot here. I don't recall too many gusset plates to the back of the head, but we even got to see that here. And how about a gusset plate to the hand as well? Yeah, Newman went for it all here in the finals. Eventually, it was time for the champ to jump into that driver's seat. He pulverized Jaden with a kendo stick and a thumbtack bat. Speaking of thumbtack bats, Jaden would slam one into Hoodfoot's gut and then just stomp right on the back of his head here. Not looking like he had much left, the champ would be able to turn Jaden inside out with his clothesline. Hoodfoot was nearly bleeding out here, trying to give his best, but he just kept taking strike after strike and he looked to be done for. Catching his third win here, Hoodfoot would land some stiff shots of his own before shooting Jaden up into the air and bringing him down head first in the middle of the ring with a Ghostbuster. And that would be it, folks. He weathered the storm. Hoodfoot survives four rounds, defending his title in each and every round, going on to win the entire tournament. Back-to-back -back years, by the way. When you go back and look at December as a whole, this makes for five successful American Deathmatch title defenses for Hoodfoot. On July 8th at Crimson Crown Wrestling's When the Dying Calls, Sage Sin Supreme would be tasked with defending her CCW Supreme Violence Championship against Raven Havoc. After a more technical start to this match, the Supreme Violence picked up after Havoc pinpointed some light two attacks to Sage's limbs. The Pumpkin Queen would literally reach into her bag of tricks to try and take control of the match though. And I think an electric pumpkin carver should help get the job done. We would also see some high impact moves onto light tubes, including some double knees in the corner from the champ. As the match made its way outside of the ring, a syringe made a little cameo by getting shoved into Sage's arm. Things would only get worse for her as Havoc brought down a light tube fan right across the back of her head. The end would come as they made their way back into the ring because that's where Sage Sin drove Raven Havoc down through a door covered in barbed wire and light tubes. The Pumpkin Queen takes the victory, leaving still your CCW Supreme Violence Champion. Crimson Crown Wrestling held their Violent World Show on March 30th, and that's where Sage Sin Supreme would put her Supreme Violence title up for grabs yet again. This time against Kikyo, who came out rocking the old Supreme Violence title, claiming that she was the true champion, not Sage Sin. Right away, these two went straight for light tubes, looking to utilize them any way they could. With this match coming in and just over 10 minutes long, we saw these two beat the hell out of one another. And I'm talking head butts, chair shots, barbed wire baseball bat shots, C4 energy drinks to the back of the head, whips into fans' chairs, but this DVD onto the concrete floor with a bat linked between them looked to be one of the scariest moments of the match. Luckily, Sage was able to recover, but the bad luck struck twice as Kikio was sliced open badly with this tube shot. Now, the staff were able to tape her arm up so the match could continue, but it would not last much longer. The Pumpkin Queen set up a wild chair contraption at ringside, and after trading some shots on the ring apron, Sage would jerk her challenger down violently through the chairs and a door to score the victory. That means Sage Sin Supreme escapes WrestleMania weekend with the belt still in her possession. 
On July 2nd at CCW Scars and Stripes event in Los Angeles, Sage Sin Supreme would be putting her title up against a deathmatch veteran, a guy who was having his first match at nearly a year. And that would be Homeless Jimmy. Sage then took it to a challenger early and would use his own shopping cart against him by ramming light tubes directly into his crotch. The beatdown continued with a fan of light tubes and she would even hit a brutal looking code red off of the shopping cart. Jimmy got a little bit of offense in here, but it wouldn't be that much. He got a couple light tube shots in and then he broke out this devastating looking chair wrapped in barbed wire. At the end of the match, Sage Sin pulled Jimmy onto his own shopping cart once again and would blind him with green mist to the face. He also rubbed the mist into her face as well and then countered with a big looking DDT down onto the cart. He quickly covered Sage and picked up a three count victory. That means Homeless Jimmy becomes the fourth CCW Supreme Violence Champion, ending Sage Sin's reign at 245 days. The new CCW Supreme Violence Champion, Homeless Jimmy, would try to make his first title defense against another deathmatch veteran and the inaugural champion, BC Killer. This would take place at CCW's Friday Night Brawl on September 29th. I also need to point out that the former champion Sage Sin would be refing this match and it didn't look like she wanted to let go of that title anytime soon. Right away, Jimmy found out this was not going to be an easy match as he started off getting manhandled. Some glass in the eyes would not help matters for him either. The champ would use BC's own blade against him to get back into this match, allowing him to counter with his own tube shots. As Jimmy went to use some skewers, he was caught off guard with a face full of tacks blinding him yet again. That's when the carpet strips were broke out. Oh, and as for those skewers, they never really did work out for Jimmy. Now, throughout this match, BC Killer and Sage Sin, they got into it several times, eventually leading to pure chaos with the Devil's Brigade involving themselves into this thing. Eventually, this would backfire on BC, leading to Jimmy diving over the top rope, driving his opponent down through a pumpkin pit of doom. There would be no kicking out of that one, folks, while laid out on a bed of pumpkins, Homeless Jimmy picks up the win, securing his first title defense. He will end 2023, your CCW Supreme Violence Champion. Tommy Vendetta came into 2023, the ex-ICW Extreme Intense Champion, and at Horror Slam's Death of the Easter Bunny on April 7th, he would defend the title against KJ Reynolds. This appeared to be a one-sided beatdown for quite some time as Vendetta punished Reynolds in a big way. After taking several light tube shots, KJ had enough and shotgun kicked Tommy straight back through a door in the corner. He then showcased his athleticism by landing a 450 splash onto the outside, caving Tommy's chest in. The champ caught KJ going for another high-risk move and made him pay by driving him through a pane of glass with his backpack sent on. Tommy wouldn't be done just yet though as he brought a box of Legos into play. You would have thought this pile driver would have been the end of KJ, but he kicked out and fired off several light tube shots onto Tommy looking to make a last second comeback. This perfectly placed kick and one more brutal looking pile driver would put an end to any comeback however, as Tommy Vendetta picks up the victory. So yes, Tommy leaves still the champion, but before he officially left, he did give a big kudos to KJ Reynolds for putting up a a solid fight and the fans, they agreed. At XICW's Scar Wars event on July 15th, Tommy Vendetta would be attempting to make it a full year as the XICW Extreme Intense Champion. The only person that would be standing in his way though would be the 12 time champion himself, DBA. Things would get started off with a classic gentleman's staple gun trade-off. You guessed it though, Tommy would play a little dirty, taking advantage of DBA and crown himself the winner of that trade-off. Once the match spilled outside of the ring, things took a turn with DBA drilling Vendetta with cookie sheets, fans, shoes, more staples into... Staple his ass! <laughs> Staple his ass? Yeah! yeah. He also used golf clubs and even some fan signs. Back in the ring that almost resembled a strip club dance floor at this point, DBA made a solid effort trying to win back the title for a 13th time. With some help from the fans, he buried the champion with chairs as he made his way to the top rope, looking to hit that flaming elbow drop. 
Tommy spoiled that, though, by pulling DBA down and planting him onto the pile of chairs with a pile driver. Then it was Tommy's turn to be taken down from the top rope as DBA connected with his Betty White driver. Vendetta was able to kick out of that and roll outside of the ring. That's where DBA went after Tommy, but he was outsmarted when he took a chair to the face and one last pile driver to do him in. With this win, Tommy will officially hit that one-year mark as champion. I'm going to do my best to cover the XICW Extreme Intense Championship. Champion Tommy Vendetta put his title on the line while ICW No Holds Barred were in Detroit. His opponent would be Crazy King. And I believe he lives up to that name because he started this match off by breaking a bundle of light tubes over his own head. This match was just, it was very good. We saw DVDs, a sky-high pop-up powerbomb, a Darren McCarty run-in with a hockey stick, a backpack cannonball through a door with Legos, a pile driver from the chains, and even an armbar. And what better way to escape an armbar than to start shooting staples into your opponent's skin? This was a very solid performance from Crazy King, but he broke the cardinal rule and he touched Tommy's Legos. Tommy planted King down with a big body slam and then followed it up with the trifecta of pile drivers all into his Legos to pick up the win. Tommy Vendetta holds on to his XICW Extreme Intense Championship and now is well over a year into his current run. Just two days after Thanksgiving, Tommy Vendetta was forced to defend his XICW Extreme Intense Championship against both Remington Roar and DBA in triple threat action at XICW show titled Thanksgiving Thunder. With chandeliers hanging over them, they fought around the building, avoiding the ring like the plague early on. Roar would take a suplex onto the hard floor, followed by DBA, who ate a back body drop onto that floor. At one point, DBA used a fan's boot to beat on the defending champion. Eh, that was until Roar nearly took his head off with a steel chain wrapped around his fist. The carnivore then used that chain to choke the life out of Vendetta. That's when the fans were treated to a beautiful chop fest between the three right in front of their very eyes. The end came with a bunch of quick exchanges, seeing each competitor try to sneak in that win. Roar thought he had at first with his chokeslam onto the ring apron, but Vendetta would manage to counter that with his pile driver in the ring. DBA broke that up and then hit his Betty White driver onto Tommy. But Roar broke that up, looking to go for maybe an F5 type maneuver, but DBA countered that with another Betty White driver. To ensure the win, DBA went on to hit that flaming elbow drop onto Remington Roar, but Vendetta scooped him up, chucked him outside of the ring, and stole the win with the three count, meaning Thomas Oliver Vendetta ends 2023, still your ex-ICW Extreme Intense Champion. At RPW's This Time It's War event on January 20th, we saw the RPW Rust Belt Deathmatch Champion Randy West put her title on the line against Satu Jin. And right off the bat, you could tell we were in for a war with Jin crushing this bundle of light tubes over the head of the champ to start this match off. These two battled it out for over 18 minutes, and this was honestly one of my favorite title matches of the month. After being bloody beaten and exhausted, the end of the match came when Randy took her shirt off and wrapped it around Jin's throat, choking him out. This was a big statement win here for the veteran, and after the match, you could see these were two wrestlers who respected the hell out of each other. For the next deathmatch title we're going to cover here, we are staying with RPW to talk about the RPW Rust Belt Championship match between the champion Randy West, who has held this title for well over a year now, taking on the challenger Danny DeMonto. Now, this match was originally scheduled to be Randy West versus Casey Kirk, but it looked like Casey Kirk had her nose broken, at least busted very badly the night before against Lufisto. So Danny stepped in as her replacement. And just like her good friend Hoodfoot, Randy was also seen repping the ref shirt in support of SPO on this night. Oh, and speaking of SPO, things actually started out here with Danny and Randy sharing a blunt with an empty chair meant to be for him nearby. As we got into the action though, a majority of this match saw outside of the ring brawling where they used gusset plates, light tubes, exploding baseball bats. They even broke some fan's chair. And then for one second, it looked like we were about to get a new champion after the DeMonto driver onto Randy, but she got her shoulder up after a cocky pin attempt. She would be able to ram her head into his groin Yep, that, that's what happened. Several times to counter a second DeMonto driver, and then she followed up with a backdrop driver through the chairs for the three count. 
So the epic title reign continues for Randy West as she leaves Street Trash, still your RPW Rust Belt champion. There was no RPW show this month, but Randy West came to ICW No Holds Barred Volume 46 show and decided to put her RPW Rust Belt Deathmatch Championship up against Jeff Cannonball. Things got weird in this match, as they normally do with Cannonball, but before they did, Jeff put Randy through a door just to start this thing. He would also introduce a deadly piece of paper into this match, which he used to give Randy several different paper cuts. It's also a good thing Jeff and his wife, Tara Calloway, just got pregnant because Randy made sure to make that a one and done scenario with some center blocks here. Like I said, eventually things did get a little weird at one point. Aw, come on, Jeff. Cannonball would construct one wild looking contraption consisting of water jugs, cinder blocks, and a door with cut cans on it. But whatever plan he had backfired because Randy was able to put him through a setup just long enough to score the three count. It was an unexpected title match where Randy West keeps her reign going 15 months strong now as the RPW Rust Belt Deathmatch Champion. Heading back to RPW's Take As Needed For Pain show, we saw Randy West putting her Rust Belt Championship on the line against the carnivore, Remington Roar. Roar utilized his strength early on, holding Randy up with one arm as he grabbed a bundle of light tubes to position behind her back and then slammed her down with a falcon arrow. Randy tried to overcome the size disadvantage at points, but as expected, Roar just controlled the majority of this contest. A thumbtack cactus was used in multiple ways during this match, some more creative than others. A little more deadly, though, was Roar's machete that he used to carve away at Randy's forehead. Even after being brutalized all match long, Randy was able to muster up a big reversal off the middle rope and then pulled out one of the biggest gusset plates I have ever seen to stick it into the back of Roar. After he kicked out of a pin attempt, Randy locked in her guillotine choke that she has used to beat so many of her opponents in the past. But Roar wasn't about to tap out though, so Randy pulled out a taser and used it against Roar to put him away for the victory. Still your RPW Rust Belt Champion now approaching 500 days. We're talking about Randy West. The RPW Rust Belt Champion Randy West put her title on the line at Flophouse Wrestling's No Fucks Given show on August 4th. The man to come out challenging her for that title would be a very cocky Kevin Giza. Almost immediately though, Randy's buddy Pete came into play as she grinded it into Giza's forehead. You gotta respect kendo sticks and the traditional barbed wire bats, which were both broke out in this match. Giza found himself distracted by the fans and really just finding any way for them to hate him. After taunting the fans with the barbed wire door in the corner, he finally ate a spear through it. Showing off would cost him several times in this match, but none more than this high risk where he crashed directly onto the ring apron, falling out of the ring. And then after one too many splashes in the corner, he missed big time, almost knocking himself out. The champ capitalized with a butterfly suplex and then clinched in her guillotine choke, forcing Kevin Giza to tap out. Brandy West wasn't done because she came to the ring to start off the King of the Kill event on August 12th, not scheduled to compete by the way, but would put her title on the line anyways. The fans were treated with an impromptu RPW Rust Belt triple threat title match with Chuck Stein and Mongo. Listen, Mongo got pulverized in this match. He took on some 2v1 barbed wire door shots, light tubes driven into his back. He was dropped right onto his neck here by the champ. Plus he took on some dual light tube shots. I do want to point out a very scary moment at the end of this match where Randy was trying to pin Chuck, but Mongo went to break it up with a light tube shot. As he hits Randy, Glass goes flying right into the face of Chuck. Look at this in slow-mo. Luckily, this did not result in any type of injury here. As Mongo was trying to pin Chuck, Randy caught him from behind with a splash to the back and then rolled him over to pick up the pin. That makes for two successful title defenses in the month of August for Randy and wow, what an insane reign she is having right now with over 500 days as champ. It's going to continue into September. The historic RPW Rust Belt Championship reign of Randy West was on the line as she was putting the belt up against the winner of RPW's King of the Kill Tournament. That is Tommy Vendetta. And this match, of course, took place at RPW's Devil's Night 2 on October 14th. The long-sleeved era of Tommy Vendetta was in full effect here as he pissed off the fans with an attack from behind jump-starting this match. 
After getting dominated for a little bit here, Randy grabbed this chain looking to get back into the match and she whipped it around the leg of Vendetta. That allowed her to get on top of him for a little bit of a beatdown. She also used it to start dragging him around the ring to do as she pleased. Much to the fans' pleasure, Randy managed to rip Tommy's shirt off, but of course he was wearing a second one underneath. Sadly for Tommy though, that shirt does not protect him against the concrete floor. Randy would stack up some doors on the outside of the ring, and after drilling Tommy with Prickly Pete, the challenger fell back, almost breaking his back in half. Those doors did not give one bit. She rolled Tommy back into the ring, hitting her shadows over hell splash, looking to put it into this match. But as she was rolling Vendetta over, he swiftly rolled her up into a small package, picking up a shocking victory. As the booze filled Berwyn Eagles, Thomas, Oliver, Vendetta, just began laughing as he clutched his new title tight. Randy's epic title reign comes to a close at 595 days, a number that most likely will never be touched. Heading over to the main event of that RPW Whiteout show, Tommy Vendetta would be tasked with trying to defend his newly won Rust Belt Championship against one of the best no ring deathmatch wrestlers in the entire world. We're talking Casanova Valentine. And just because he knows it gets under the fan's skin, Tommy would of course be sporting a hoodie to start this match off. Hoodie or not though, Casanova utilized the fans to his benefit with the help of a couple skateboards that he found laying around. The layers of protection would be peeled off of the champion as Valentine body slammed him onto a thumbtack skateboard, followed then by a light tube skateboard. Even though Tommy would manage to slide his shirt back on, he still ate several light tubes to the head, as well as a hot stick down low. After Casanova dominated a solid portion of this match, Tommy would find a staple gun laying around to help turn the tide. He then lashed out at his challenger, drilling him with every single thing he could get his hands on. While going on this tirade, Tommy seems to have overestimated his strength just a little bit, trying to powerbomb Casanova, but he took a belly to belly through a door as punishment. We got a little more fan participation before we saw the champion uh, impaled on a forward object. Looking to close out the match, Vendetta stepped up onto a ramp, but that's where he caught a bundle of light tubes to the head. Casanova locked in the claw, going for his trademark slam, but Vendetta countered by sliding down the ramp, rolling the challenger up for a surprise three-count victory. Casanova was left shocked as Tommy Vendetta sneaks away with the victory, making his first successful RPW Rust Belt title defense. We saw a brand new deathmatch title lineage begin, the RPW Kamikaze Championship. This title is meant to be defended anywhere in the world in any company to symbolize deathmatch excellence. And to crown that inaugural champion, we saw Mickey Knuckles take on Reed Bentley and Schwartzy in triple threat action. These three had a good back and forth match, seeing plenty of low blows and yes, anal plugging. Not sure if I can even say that, but either way, there was one thing that I noticed was Reed Bentley seemed to be favoring his arm the whole match, so I hope he's all right there. Whatever he had going on, it did not stop him from hitting a Pepsi plunge onto Schwartzy through light tubes. Mickey had to come in and break that up, saving the match. Schwartzy locked in his figure four leg lock onto Mickey, trying to secure that win, but Reed came in to break that up with a brutal kick into some tubes. Then just a little bit later, Mickey landed her trademark pump handle slam onto Schwartzy, which many thought would be the end, and it was. But not for Schwartzy. But not for me. As Mickey went for that pin, Schwartzy pulled her down into a triangle choke to choke her out. With that, Schwartzy becomes Ruthless Pro Wrestling's first ever Kamikaze Champion. This title is supposed to be defended anywhere in the world, and it looks like Schwartzy's first title defense will be a Flophouse Wrestling Show on July 14th against Eric Dillinger, so do not miss that. Now on to RPW's Kamikaze Championship held by the inaugural champion, Schwartzy. At Flophouse Wrestling's FLP Punk event, he would try to defend his title for the first time against Eric Dillinger. This no-ring deathmatch got fired up with a chop fest, and these chops were being laid in big time here. And then pretty quickly, this match spilled out into the streets. I really wonder what people driving by were thinking while this was going on. 
barbed wire bats were broke out. We saw barbed wire doors being broken. There were also chairs wrapped in barbed wire being used. Oh, and barbed wire halos as well. Lots of barbed wire, if you haven't picked up on that yet. We even saw Schwartzy lock in his figure four with barbed wire tangled up around their legs. Dillinger tried to fight through the pain, but in the end, he just couldn't hang in there and was forced to tap out. That means Schwartzy is successful in his first Kamikaze title defense. It will be pretty interesting to see what company shows up in next, putting that belt on the line. For Schwartzy's second RPW Kamikaze title defense attempt, he would show up in True Wrestling Underground on July 28th to take on one half of the Bruisers, Mitch Malik, in a no-ring death match. An early gusset plate opened up a gusher on the challenger as these two brawled all around the building. That brawling would eventually find its way outside of the building as well in the parking lot. With Schwartzy laid out on an OSB board, Mitch made his way up onto the roof of this red truck. He came off the roof driving an almost cactus-like elbow down onto the champion. It wouldn't be enough, however, and the two started to make their way back into the building. Not before Schwartzy continuously pancaked Mitch with one of the doors, though. The champ tried to introduce light tubes into the equation, but was instantly thwarted with a clothesline. Mitch tried to take back control of this match, but caught a chair right in the face, and with that, Schwartzy pounced on his challenger, delivering unanswered shots to the back of the head, forcing the ref to call for the match. Schwartzy leaves Brownstown, Michigan, still the Kamikaze champion. August 12th at RPW's King of the Kill event, Schwartzy would put his RPW Kamikaze Championship on the line against the returning Herzog. Herzog's unique style seemed to give him an early advantage when he slammed Schwartzy through a barbed wire door. The match soon spilled out of the ring where they would fight amongst the fans. And after nearly trashing the whole ringside area, they found their way back into the ring where Herzog took a nasty monkey flip through a pane of glass. He would go on to answer that with a choke slam through a pane of glass. But Schwartzy was not about to give up that easy. With a bonfire raging in the background, the champ would hit a light tube assisted, Sister Abigail following that up with clubbing blows to the back of the head, forcing the ref to jump in and call for the match via stoppage. Schwartzy left maybe Michigan, still your RPW Kamikaze champion. In another deathmatch title that was defended at RPW's Devil's Night 2, Schwartzy faced a tall task, putting his RPW Kamikaze title up against Remington Roar. The champ did his best to evade the powerhouse challenger, but eventually his luck would run out. Roar would begin choking the life out of Schwartzy with a chain, and things started to look a little grim. Getting desperate, the champ grabbed one of Roar's machetes, but even that backfired, leaving him on the wrong end of the blade. Don't get me wrong, Schwartzy did get a little bit of offense in here, but even his Hiawaska DDT failed to go his way. Things did start to look up for Schwartzy when he caught Roar off guard with a pane of glass to the face, but the writing was on the wall. This would be Remington Roar's night. He finished Schwartzy off in spectacular fashion, by the way, to score a three count victory and win the RPW Kamikaze Championship. Schwartzy's reign comes to an end at 119 days with three successful title defenses, but the reign of Roar has begun. On December 9th, Ruthless Pro Wrestling held their whiteout no ring deathmatch show in Dearborn, Michigan. Kicking off the show, Remington Roar would be attempting to make his first ever defense of his newly won RPW Kamikaze Championship that he won back in October. His opponent would be the wife of the man he took the title from, Randy West. With the ambush, Randy took early advantage with light tubes and nails, but the champ would end up returning the favor tenfold though. Now, just like their match back in June, Roar would display his full on strength advantage here, making Randy pay big time. But if you remember, Randy ended up winning that match and after going for his eyes here, she battled back looking like the favorite to get the win. She even found a weed whacker, which somehow found its way into a skate park and rammed it into the back of the champ twice. Roar would catch Randy going for another dive and powered her up onto his shoulder so he could drive her down through this door to finish her off. Remington Roar finally gets a win over Randy West, making him 1-3 against her in his career, and that means he also will be walking away into 2024, your RPW Kamikaze Champion. 